that uh, you are all here with us today for our special 20th annual Duke UNC Rotary Peace Center Conference. Uh, we also want to welcome all of the people around the world who may be joining us uh, remotely today. My name is Randy Lippy, and I have the honor of serving as the host area coordinator for this Peace Center. Today we gather around the theme, New Paradigms of Peace, Development, and Sustainability. As a courtesy to our presenters and your fellow guests, please take a moment to pull out your cell phones or other devices and silence them uh, or turn them off. I will tell a story quickly that I did that one time at a Rotary meeting where I said if the phone went off, it would cost you $1,000 to the Rotary Foundation. <laughs> I placed my phone behind me and two minutes later, my phone rang. So, as you might imagine, I made a contribution to the Rotary Foundation. <laughs> we are fortunate uh, today to have with us past Rotary Foundation Trustee Chair Brenda Cressy. Uh, and at this moment, I would like to invite Brenda to come up and make a few remarks. Thank you so much, and good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see so many bright and shiny faces so early in the morning. Uh, but on behalf of our current foundation chair, Ian Risley, past president of Rotary International, I bring you greetings from headquarters in Evanston, Illinois. I'm delighted to be here. You can't even imagine how happy I am to be here in North Carolina with you to participate in the Duke UNC Rotary Peace Center Spring Conference, 20 years. The Rotary Peace Center happens to be a personal passion of mine, and I'm proud to say that my husband Dick and I have supported this special program for a very long time, and so I'm especially happy to be here in this gathering. The Duke UNC Rotary Peace Center was one of the first centers to be launched by the Rotary Foundation in honor of our founder, Paul Harris. And now here we are, celebrating the 20th class. The center has been a leader in so many ways and undoubtedly provided guidance and inspiration to our newest peace centers in Istanbul, where we hope to launch in 2025. I extend my sincere thanks to the co-directors, faculty, staff, who have all helped Duke UNC Rotary Peace Centers thrive. It's because of your efforts our world is closer to resolving the daunting issues that we all face today. When this year's class of graduates at Duke UNC, will have, we will have launched 175 77 Rotary Peace Center graduates. Yeah, it's pretty nice. They're in careers throughout the world that promote peace and resolve conflict. And to date, UNC and Duke fellows are working in 64 countries, and no doubt this new class is expected to expand that number even more. So no one in this room, I'm sad to say, has lived in a time of world peace. The Rotary Peace Center's work in training the next generation of peace builders is more important now than ever. We face a world that struggles to create communities that support differences in opinions, differences in religion, differences in beliefs, and we face overwhelming questions that challenges as the best ways to create safe places while nurturing our core values. As humanitarians, we Rotarians do what we can do to promote a more peaceful world. All of Rotary's programs address humanitarian issues that are exacerbated by war, and dissension. I believe in Rotary, and I know many of you do as well. And I believe there is a cause for optimism about the state of our world. The media presents 
a relentless parade of war and violence. And yet, I want to think that most of us would like to see an end to war and destruction. By seeking ways to end conflict, we open the door to a healthier world in many, many ways. And as of today, there have been only one cases found in Pakistan for polio this year. We are indeed this close. That one case is heartbreaking, but we have so many people working and supporting this effort, Rotary's number one focus. Despite continued conflict in Afghanistan and Pakistan, these two countries have both worked to eradicate polio forever. What a wonderful example that proves that despite everything, the world can work together to make this a better place. So I personally look forward to hearing all the presentations from each of this year's graduates. I believe today's presentations will enrich our lives and that of our Peace Fellows and will also enrich the world with their continued vision, energy, and wisdom. As past trustee chair of the Rotary Foundation, I bring you all congratulations from the foundation trustees and leadership and the 9,000 Rotarians here in this region who have supported this program. I know that the class of 2023 our 20th anniversary class will certainly do us proud. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brenda. We appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to come and be with us uh, throughout this weekend. So thank you very much. I would now like to ask the members of the uh, Duke UNC Rotary Peace Center Board uh, to stand as I call their names and be recognized. Let's see if I can make this work. Perhaps if I turn it on. So first, uh, and certainly um, most importantly for a lot of us, Susan Carroll, our managing director. John Abels from Duke University, who is in the nether regions uh, up here. John is helping us today as we field questions from our online uh, uh, audience. Uh, Sharon Thomas uh, from UNC could not be with us uh, today. Carol Allen, our longtime Rotary representative on the board. Tom Lassiter, our program uh, manager. Where's Tom? He may be out working, doing some things. <laughs> oh, he's in the booth. Uh, Our faculty directors, Carol, uh, excuse me, Catherine Adcock Adme from Duke, and Suzanne Maimon from UNC. And we have our co directors, Emeritus uh, Francis Letham from Duke, is Francis, Francis, and Jim Peacock from UNC. And we have two alumni representatives on our board, uh, Muyatwa Satali, who lives in Geneva, and Karina Ito, who lives in Brazil, and they are not with us today. <laughs> so if you have an opportunity throughout the day or, or at any other time to uh, meet with any of these individuals, uh, please uh, thank them for all they do for our center. In addition to our Peace Center board, uh, we have several current and past Rotary leaders with us today. Our Peace Center would not exist uh, but for the commitment over many, many years now of past and present Rotary leadership in creating and sustaining our Peace Center's program. Uh, today we have with us uh, past Rotary International Director David Michaud uh, and his wife Sarah. Past Rotary International Director Ken Morgan. I know I've seen Ken. There he is. Past Rotary International Director Peter Kyle. 
and his wife, Margaret. Uh, we have uh, two sitting governors with us, I know, today. Uh, District 7710 Governor Nathan Thomas. And District 7680 Governor Cam Shandon. So uh, all of you know who are in Rotary never give a past district governor a microphone. And uh, we have way too many past district governors here today for me to recognize, I'm not gonna take that amount of time, nor give them the pleasure. Uh, <laughs> but, but thank you all for joining us. Uh, it, it is, uh, this is a great day and we appreciate you uh, being here. Uh, throughout uh, the term of, of the fellowship for each of our fellows, uh, they're all matched uh, with a local Rotarian who serves as their Rotary host counselor. And I'm gonna get rid of that slide. So our Rotary host counselors and their families uh, uh, are, are the people that will meet them at the airport, welcome them uh, into our new uh, community, uh, help them navigate and understand our complex customs and laws at times, uh, and be a friendly resource for each of the fellows throughout their two years here. Uh, we have with us in the audience, I know, a number of, of past and current uh, host counselors, and I would ask them to stand uh, just to be recognized. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you all for all you do. I can tell you it makes my life uh, much, much easier. So, uh, I'll now ask Susan Carroll to come forward and introduce our first year Peace Fellows, also known as Class 21. Good morning. So welcome to our 20th annual Duke UNC Rotary Peace Conference. You already know my name is Susan Carroll and I'm the managing director of the center. Um, it has taken us four years to return to what I would consider to be a normal conference. So this is indeed a special year. We welcome those of you sitting in the, here in the Nelson Mandela Auditorium at the University of North Carolina as well as our virtual audience members who are tuning in from all around the world. In a few minutes, you'll have the chance to meet our graduating Rotary Peace Fellows who will present their work, the work they have undertaken during their time as graduate students at Duke and UNC. After their presentations, they will participate in a series of panel discussions where you will have a chance to join the conversation by asking them questions. So I'm going to introduce the first year uh, Rotary Peace Fellows. Please note that everyone's bio, especially the graduating cohorts, um, detailed bios are in the, um, uh, in the program. So I'd like all of the fellows to just go ahead and stand up, class 21, please. And come on, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> So studying at Duke, UNC, Duke University, we have Sean Chawe from Thailand, Jorge Delgado Golusta from Chile, Christian Menin from Brazil, Mai Nguyen from Vietnam, Mustafa Rezaei from Afghanistan, and Estefania Rodriguez from Mexico. And studying at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, we have Alexi Mwanza Kabongo from the Democratic Republic of Congo, Alexandra Rose from Australia, Sara Solomon from Ethiopia, and Gibson Zulu from Zambia. Are you, are you coming up for more? I'm ready. Well, I have more to say, oh, but um, <laughs> no, I mean, okay, all right, I'll let you. We didn't, we didn't practice this part. Um, <laughs> So as part of our 20th anniversary year, we have asked several alumni to send us short videos um, to tell us about the impact of the Rotary Peace Fellowship on their personal and professional lives. So today you'll have a chance to see four of those videos. And please look out for others in the coming months on our social media because um, they're really wonderful testaments. So 
And before we begin, um, here are a few important points for our in-person audience. Please don't walk in front of the projection room, which is really hard to do right now because there are camera stands set up back there, so I don't think you'll be able to do that. Um, there are restrooms upstairs and downstairs. Um, as Randy said, please turn off all your mobile devices. And if for some reason you are also tuned into the webinar, you should not be. Because <laughs> that will make noise too. Um, and for all conference attendees, near and far, we will be alternating questions between our live and our virtual audiences. So to our virtual audience today, um, please ask questions. Uh, you can po put those into the Q&A on the webinar platform, and um, we are monitoring those questions. And regarding questions for everyone, we'll ask an actual question. No comments, no statements, no lectures. Um, I, you can do those out in the breaks. Um, with limited time that we have, one question. So don't say, I have a three-part question. Um, and with over 300 people attending today, our fellows are, will obviously not be able to answer all your questions. And for that, we apologize. Um, and I'm going to hand it back over to Randy. Thank you, Susan. So anybody that's been at a podium before knows that uh, whenever you list a group of people, you're inevitably going to miss someone. Uh, and I would like to recognize Pass Rotary International Director Karen Wentz, who is also here with us today. <laughs> Forgive me for my oversight. That will hopefully not cost me another thousand dollars, but... Uh... <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Susan said, today you have the privilege of hearing from our second year fellows uh, who will soon be graduating uh, and moving on to the next phase of their careers. Uh, during their presentations, you will hear a variety of viewpoints. Uh, you might or might not agree with all of those uh, viewpoints, but please remember everybody's entitled to their views uh, and be courteous in any discourse and questions uh, because that's what we're about, peace and conflict resolution. So I'd like to close now with a, a quote from one of my favorite philosophers, Dr. Seuss, uh, who said, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And I hope by the end of the day today, you will uh, agree with me that each of our fellows cares a whole awful lot. Uh, and we can be very optimistic about the impacts each of them will make throughout their lives in the advancement of Rotary's goal to make positive change around the world in the pursuit of peace. Thank you very much. Hello friends, I'm making this little video from the porch of my office at the International Storytelling Center on this dreary East Tennessee day you can see all around you. And I'm really pleased to do this because it's an opportunity to sort of share my gratitude and my thanks to the Rotary Peace Fellowship. It's not one individual, it's a team, it's a family. And that's really what has helped to guide me to where I am today, to do what I'm doing today. I became a US citizen just a few weeks ago. I got married last year, I have a daughter, I have life and I've made home. But I think back to the times when, when I didn't believe in myself, uh, and two elderly Rotarians in Scotland listened to my story and they said, you should be a peace fellow. And they helped give me the confidence and helped me realize that I had something to offer when I doubted myself. When I came to the United States in 2011 to go to UNC Chapel Hill and Duke, I again didn't think I'd get through it. And the peace fellows around me, those professors, the Rotarians, it was more than, it made me realize it wasn't just about academic achievements. It was about believing in yourself, knowing that you have experience and something to offer. And I know that whatever we do in life, we stand on the shoulders of those that come before us. And we have mentors and teachers and they come in different forms. I know I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for those teachers, those mentors and those friends. The professors, the colleagues, my housemates, my Rotary Peace Fellow family over two years of study together, 
that we took that big leap of faith, not knowing what, how that story would unfold for us. And, but we took that faith and we had a guidance of people around us, helping us, shaping us, feeding us, supporting us, you know, giving us cups of tea when we need to. And we had people we could, when we fell down, people that would pick us up. And that's the important part of the Rotary Peace Fellowship. It's a family of people that are networked, that are helping one another. Not just about how great we get our marks, but how we guide and help. What it did is help us to realize what we have to offer in our experiences. I'm really grateful for that. And I appreciate that now that I get to help other people do it, to help them realize the story of their potential. That's my purpose, that's my dream, and that's my hope. And it's thanks so much to all of you, to Rotary Rotarians, those who invest in Rotary, Peace Fellows, Professors, the network, the initiative itself, which is beautiful. Thank you for supporting it. Please keep supporting it. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you and have a beautiful, beautiful Peace Conference. marginalization in governance and social policy. So good morning everyone. Uh, present here today, good afternoon and evening for those watching uh, on Zoom, including my family. Uh, my name is Sakina Dharajiwala. Uh, I'm a Peace Fellow from India. And today I'm going to be talking about overcoming last mile challenges um, on how research can be used to impact social policy um, through the journey of my work in India. But before I start with last mile challenges, I'd like to ask the audience here um, to, by a show of hands, tell me if you've ever experienced a technical snag at work or while you know making a payment the trans transaction didn't go through you had to try again <laughs> pretty much everyone right yeah i thought as much um this happens it happens a lot um for instance you go to a grocery store you're trying to use your card payment failed you try again use another card it can be a bit frustrating but it's it's somewhat okay you try another time however um, it can be every, if I told you that each time you had a payment failure, you paid a penalty for it. And just like uh, uh, Randy said that, you know, if his, if his phone rang, he had to pay $1,000. That's a sharp penalty, isn't it? Um, and that's, that's unfair and it's frustrating when it's not your fault. That's what last mile challenges are. Um, at the very last step of your transaction, at the very last step of, you know, checking out, um, when there is a payment failure, or there is some kind of um, a challenge that you have to face. That's what I mean by last mile challenges. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about it in the context of social policies in India. Why am I talking about social policies in India? Because it's a big deal. Um, social program expenditures just on cash transfers amount to about 12 billion US dollars in India. And they go towards improving education, healthcare, income support programs. So the last mile challenges are a pretty big deal. But last mile challenges are also very hard to document. Um, this photograph that you see here is one from uh, the state of Jharkhand in India that I have taken during my field work, where you see these women lined up outside a bank uh, waiting to transact, collect their money. Uh, but the bank has shut its doors. Why? Because the computer system was down. Um, it's very hard to document these kind of challenges. Uh, it's also very difficult to establish accountability. If the computer system was down, who is responsible for it and who should be? Was it the bank managers? Maybe not. Um, it's also very difficult to resolve it quickly because it's difficult to establish accountability, track uh, what's happening with the payment and so on. And it is especially burdensome for women. As you can see, many of these women are carrying children on their back, or coming with toddlers. It's not only the cost that you pay to come to the bank, but it's also the time that you spend going back and forth, sometimes several miles that you have to travel. Um, and also the opportunity cost. So sometimes you lose a whole day's wage in coming all the way to the bank. Um, 
So these are essentially, it's difficult to track these. Um, specifically, I want to give you an example uh, of a last mile challenge that I have been working on in India uh, on the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. Um, another picture from, um, from field work in Rajasthan that you see, these women are constructing a farm pond. And they do manual labor work and earn a minimum wage. It's an incredibly important social saf safety net in India and has its origins in famine relief work. Now, during one of these visits, I met a lady called Radha Devi. Radha had worked in uh, the Employment Guarantee Program uh, as a laborer and had accrued about, uh, you know, earned about 12,000 Indian rupees, which is approximately 200 US dollars worth of wages. Um, when I met her, uh, she said she hadn't been paid. So I asked her what happened. And she told me that, you know, when the other women who worked with me started getting money in their bank accounts, I went to check my bank account too. And they told me at the bank that there's nothing in your account. Your wages haven't come yet. So she said, okay, maybe, you know, sometimes it takes time. She went back to the bank. And she made several such trips to the bank. And her wages were still not in her bank. So she went to the administrative office, where, uh, which is responsible for running this program, and she asked them, OK, what's going on? And they said, you know what? We've done our job. We've put your attendance on the computer system. It's now up to the government to pay you. And they were indeed correct. They had done their job. Um, and she had still not been paid. At the time I met her, eight months had passed since the time she had worked, and she had still not been paid. So I can't stress enough. Uh, on how important it is to understand and study these challenges. And that's what brings me to, um, you know, the other thing that she's not alone. There are several more people like Radha um, who, you know, who, who go through this and uh, challenges remain undocumented. Um, about six billion rupees, uh, not dollars, rupees worth of transactions failed and bounced back only in the last year, according to government's records. And this is just this program that I'm talking about, right? There is no estimate on how many citizens get left out because of such challenges. Um, people who face these repeated transaction failures ultimately drop out of that program because you know, they, they don't get paid, they don't want to work. Um, a lot of academic research done so far has focused on exclusions in social safety nets, so targeting related questions. For instance, um, I'm a person eligible for a program. Did I make it onto the list? A lot of literature is written on targeting related questions. Uh, another part of the focus has been on corruption and leakages because of corruption. So do I have to pay a bribe to be able to get the job? Or uh, do I need to pay a bribe to be able to earn my pension or, or get the cash? Um, that, that's what brings me to uh, the story of the work that I was doing and I continue to do. Um, I work with a group called Liberation Technology India. Um, I have co-founded the organization with a team of engineers, social scientists, data scientists, social workers. And uh, we study rural policies, um, rural social policies in India. Uh, it was incubated right here at Stanford University. Uh, but ultimately, now we operate as an independent group. Um, our primary goal is to invest a lot of time in these rural areas and understand these last mile challenges. Um, what we do uh, and the method in which we work is integrate with people's movements, campaigns on right to information, right to work, and spend a lot of time listening to people. As you can see another photograph from field work, we're sitting with old age pensioners and checking the lists to see whether they have, been, they have actually received their payments or not. Um, the other thing that we do is link institutions uh, with these community organizations, academic uh, audiences, and of course, try to, as and when possible, link these rights holders directly with these institutions. Uh, we also work uh, with governments from both local to you know, the national level so that we can influence policy change based on what we learn here. Um, some of the work that we have done um, that I'd like to share with you today. If one of the things that we published in the Indian Journal of Labor Economics is uh, analyzing hidden delays in payments, um, which was ultimately used as evidence in a Supreme Court case in India. 
um, which sort of led to the government, the government of India being more held more um, being held accountable for these delays that were sort of pushed under the rug. They were hiding it because they would have to otherwise pay compensation uh, for these delays. So it was masked onto uh, you know on their website. We uncovered this and were able to hold the government accountable. Another uh, report that we came out with in 2020 is the length of the last mile, which precisely does that, right? Estimating what are these challenges, what is the cost? Um, one finding that I can share is that in one of the states that we were working, one third of the wages that were earned in that employment guarantee program were used up just to go and collect the payment. Um, and so we started disseminating this uh, report with governments, and that led to a lot of partnerships with state governments who ultimately took up research studies to estimate these costs at the last mile. Um, another example of the work that we did was to collaborate with uh, labor unions and people's movements in Rajasthan, uh, again, to hold the government accountable for uh, these bounced transactions. What you see here is an article that I co-authored with um, the chief secretary of uh, rural development in, in Rajasthan um, and working with the government as well as these people's movements there, we were able to get about um, $46 million worth of wages of workers released to them. Radha Devi, by the way, was one of those workers. So she did get her wages. Um, and at that juncture, you know, in my professional life is when I learned about the Peace Fellowship. And I thought it was a great opportunity to sort of advance what I was doing. Um, at, as a Rotary Peace Fellow, uh, one of the key areas that I wanted to work on was trying to improve um, my research skills. And I trained on rigorous quantitative academic you know, research methods while, while I was studying here. Uh, I also had a great opportunity to cross-learn so from several fellows who work here, but I also had the opportunity to work as a researcher on, uh, with the Duke's Development Lab um, to understand cash transfer programs in Pakistan. And for my master's project currently that I'm, I'm, I'm working with Professor Maleski on uh, researching payment failures in India and estimating the impact of those failures on employment. Um, another important thing that I learned here is not only how to do research, but also how to communicate it effectively, uh, which is, I think, such an important part of you know, how you disseminate it, um, not just to your peers, but also ultimately back to the audience that, uh, on, on, with whom you're conducting this research. And at the last mile now of my own journey here as a Peace Fellow, uh, I take back with me the endeavor to democratize research. Um, such that, and I'm borrowing this phrase from Dr. Abhay Bang, um, such that it's not on the people. So, you know, I'm, I'm not researching on people um, with, with a very, with a, you know, far off lens, or for the people where I'm a savior, uh, but with the people, so including people. Uh, one of the ideas um, that I hope to pursue is to expand the platform of my organization, LipTech, to have women at the margins ask and answer research questions that concern them. And um, I think, uh, you know, JBK is gonna come and talk a little bit more about a fantastic idea on how uh, representation is so important and, and, and an initiative that she's working on. But I think I'd like to end with this quote um, that Adme shared with me. Nothing about us, without us, is for us. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> My name is GBK Olua Fabarade, and I'm a Rotary Peace Fellow from Nigeria. I'm also in the Master's in International Development Policy at Duke, just like Sakina. And today, I'm here to talk about how and why to advance women's political 
Leadership for Inclusive Governance and Peace in Africa. First, I want you to look at this not so perfect family <laughs> photo of African heads of state when President Biden hosted the US leaders um, um, Africa summit. Can anybody tell me what's wrong or what's not perfect about this photo? One person? Exactly. There's just one woman and you actually have to look really well to find her in the midst of 40 plus men. So, on that note, there are two out of 54 African heads of state who are women. The president of Ethiopia and Tanzania. And in that photo from just before um, the president of Tanzania was there. And so there's the gender equity gap when it comes to looking at the heads of states alone in Africa. But Africa is not alone in this journey, because even in the United States, you've never had a female president as well. Only in 2020 um, did you elect the first female vice president, Kamala Harris. And she's currently on tour. She just took a photo with one of the two um, African women <laughs> leaders. And so we can see that progress is starting to take shape. And progress is also happening across different spheres of society, in business, um, politics, and, and even at the community level. However, at the current rate of progress, according to the UN Women, global gender equity will not be achieved for another 130 years. Can you just imagine that? Well, so we know that gender inequality persists across board, across all spheres of society. And it has far-reaching consequences on getting broader social equity and sort of sustainable growth. But why do I say this? When it comes to the population, women make 50% of most societies. Yet, in most decision-making rooms, they're missing, they're not represented. What is the cost of this? It's so difficult for you to even begin to put a number or explain those costs because data has been lacking for so many years. However, certain organizations are trying to at least put a value to help people understand, at least internalize those costs to say, this is what it costs. So we have some of those things, but there are also so many other social costs that you can't really quantify. In terms of dividends, we know that if we close the gender gap in the employment or labor market alone, there is an increase in economic output by about 35%, according to the, world, uh, to the IMF. So how about if women are able to get into positions of leadership to ensure that more women can also get into the job market? This is just in one sphere. There's so many other dividends. However, it's not just about women. When we say that getting women into decision-making decision um, places to achieve greater gender equity, it holds benefits for the entire society. According to the UN Women, women's equal participation and leadership in political office and public life are essential to achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030. So think 130 years, 2030. We need to do something. It's also according to data, research that has been done across different countries, including in India, where Sekina has spoken about, that gender-inclusive leadership plays a role when women are able to be part of systems that propose structural reforms that have a distributive agenda, that address structural inequalities, and that provide safety nets and short service delivery that reaches every sphere of society. Again, all of this is geared towards achieving the sustainable develop development goals, which includes peace and governance in an inclusive way. So just to give an example, um, many women have been part of processes, who have even led those processes when it came to critical moments of crisis and transformation. And you have a couple of them on this slide, from Liberia, the war in Liberia, to the US, um, um, to the China and Taiwan um, tensions, um, and so many other things, COVID-19. But I want to really spotlight Ngozi um, okonjo Wheeler who is currently the Director General of the World Trade Organization. She's Nigerian, just like me, so maybe that's where I'm seeing the bias. But she served in Nigeria as 
a former minister, where she helped to negotiate debt release, relief that then was able to at least free up more resources to do a lot of good. Also, unveiling corruption, like Sakina said, that really eats away from the resources that really should be going into developing our country and reaching all those people um, at the last mile. So today, I'm really talking about how to get more women, particularly African women, elected into political offices. Appointive office is good, like minister, but to really put control as well in the, in the hands of, of women to get um, everybody on board, we need to get them into political offices. So next, I've gone through the big picture. I'm going to talk about deep dive, looking at Nigeria, which is Africa's biggest economy, and then looking at innovation through Elect Her and looking at what next. So join me. Elect Her is a non-partisan social venture founded by my sister, Ibi Jokhe Favorade, um, in 2019, with a vision to see an Africa where women are equitably represented in politics and public life. To do this, addressing as a mission, underrepresentation, enabling women and democratizing politics to ensure that women can decide, run, and win elections. And my role in all of this is leveraging all of the great tools that you've made possible to me through the Rotary Peace Fellowship, learning different things about research, policy action, policy analysis, human-centered design that I used to deliver my, in my role as senior advisor on policy partnerships and growth for elector. And that's a picture of both of us with our father, um, who I hope is listening and being proud of at least the work that we're doing. So, what is the problem in Nigeria? Despite proven agency, and you've seen an impact as well, fewer Nigerian women are getting elected. We recently had our general elections um, just in February and March, and you can see on the left, it shows the representation of women who actually even got to run for office at all levels of government. Can you just imagine it's uh, just about 10% compared to men? But on the right, when they do run, the person in the, in the newspaper ad is, was on her way to being the first female governor. And even that election process also had issues. It was inc inconclusive, and they're going to do reruns. So what exactly are the barriers? What, are the, what, what, what exactly are all the problems that we can see? So we decided to reframe the problem using human-centered design to really understand the key challenges that women face um, across board when they're in the electoral journeys. At the top, we see that there are few women getting into office. But what's been it? What are the demand, supply, and enabling environment constraints that we need to unblock or unlock for these women to really Win. So first, one of the innovative ideas that, we, that that process helped us to come up with was the launch of our Agenda 35 campaign, which is, um, again, a non-partisan platform that onboards women. So one, we onboard female candidates um, across all the regions of Nigeria, irrespective of their tribe, political parties, and sort of your position in society. And we covered. Um, different geopolitical zones, eight in number, three at the federal level, four at the state level, and one at the local government level. Just pilot, let's even learn with these people. And it mirror mirrors um, the Emily's list in, in, uh, in the US, um, and we've adapted that for Nigeria. So, just to spotlight some really good um, progress that we've made, out of the three, out of the four women that we supported um, at the state level, three of them actually sent um, state legislative seats. And one of them emerged as Nigeria's youngest female state legislator, um, Rukaya Chitu, and that's just really proud progress that we can hopefully um, scale in the coming years. Second is Electors Policy and Research Center, which I work on um, heavily um, to bring all of the great um, tools that, again, I've learned at Duke to bring up um, Evidence, um, help with policy advocacy, to augment the behavioral change um, campaigns that we're running. And these are some of our products um, that we've done in the last one year, two years. Third is our elections and data hub to ensure that we had data. Again, bridge that gap in data. Um, gender disaggregated elections data that not only helps us on advocacy to get more women into office, 
but also provides women at all levels of the community access to information where they can make their own decisions about who to vote for and how to keep supporting the mandates of these people. In terms of milestones and next steps, um, we've been able to secure about over $4 million um, dollars in funding commitments from over 10 donors, and we've been able to um, implement over 12 different projects of different skills, which is good. 2019 to 2023. It's been um, a unique story that I'm proud to be part of. And in terms of next steps, we're going to be reflecting on our work so far, adapting what we've done to see where we can um, improve. And we're going to be amplifying our successes across Africa to see how we can get others to also join us um, and complement our work. So, bridging the gap requires all hands on deck. And thankfully, Rotary is already playing a huge role. That's me in the photo. I'm not president yet, at least. <laughs> um, but I'm going to ask another question. Can anybody think, do you think you'd, I could be in that seat? <laughs> Thank you for the vote of confidence. And I just wish it was that easy just going by this and I'll be in that seat. I've run for office in a non-political setting, and I know how hard it is. And maybe my colleague Simon will also share a story. He's campaigning for office in, in, in Ghana as well. It's hard, and that's why these brave women that we've supported, I'm super proud of their progress. So much needs to be done. So much needs to be unlocked for them to ensure that it not only serves them, but it serves the entire community, and most importantly, those at the very bottom that need to be lifted out of poverty. So I'm doing my part to ensure that I'm helping women get their rights because according to the constitution, at least in Nigeria, you have a right to vote and you also have a right to be voted for. So at that very first level, we're at least moving that. And thank you so much for empowering me. Through me, you're already empowering other women. So thank you. On that very last note, I really thank you so much. I want to, and want to leave you with these um, words by Ellen Sullivan Johnson, Africa's first democratically elected female president in Liberia. She says, to girls and women everywhere, I issue a simple invitation. My sisters, my daughters, my friends, find your voice. And I hope that everyone in this room I implore you to find your voice and help others find their voice as well, voices as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> Can you guys, girls come to the, women, come to the front. <laughs> All right. Sakina, if you come here, you can come here. I'm going to stand um, initially because we're going to explain the um, theme behind our conference um, panel this morning, and then we'll sit down and talk. Um, so our panel, as you know, is called Overcoming Marginalization in Governance and Social Policy. Thank you both for your contributions on this point. So in the peace building and inclusive sustainable development field, overcoming marginalization, including everyone in shared prosperity, is understood as key to bringing about positive peace and a flourishing world for all. So I want to open our panel with the words of the Indian writer and public intellectual, Arundhati Roy, who says, there's really no such thing as the voiceless. There are only the deliberately silenced or the preferably unheard. Roy offers us insight into the kind of double marginalization to which the people who are most impoverished in our world are subject. First, poor people, especially poor women, are absolutely poor, very little financial means. And second, they are treated as if they are poor in their ability to speak for themselves. They are figured as voiceless. Why are they figured as voiceless when they actually do have voices? What would it take to center and listen to and hear them. Our two speakers are thinking about marginalization from the different ends of the spectrum. GBK focuses on a top-down approach to overcoming marginalization, 
she makes the case for electing more women to high political office. Sakina advocates for a bottom-up approach where she works in partnership with rural villagers whose voices are often discredited or held as preferably unheard. We're going to think together now about the kinds of marginalization at stake. Who's marginalization? Jibike focuses on the marginalization of women in holding political electoral office. She is calling for candidates to have gender parity and suggesting that such parity may pay a dividend in promoting larger gender equity and overcoming structural inequality. This may be because the women elected, with the help of elector, may represent such women. For Jibike, the women's voices to be centered are those running for political office. Sakina focuses on the marginalization of rural villagers. She calls for democratized research so that social policy can be fashioned to address the needs and women of the, the, the needs and visions of these women and villagers. According to her methodology, researchers do the best research when they don't, they don't seek to speak for or represent others. Social marginalization in both its forms, being poorer and not being heard, is directly reduced by liberation technology because of who they approach, how they approach them, and why. For Sakina, the crucial voices to be centered are those whom too many politicians fail to represent or to hear on their own terms, poor rural women like Radha Devi work living without the wages that she's earned. Together, we will have the chance now to consider the pros and cons, being a lawyer, I like to think about those, of, <laughs> of working at either end of the spectrum, bottom up and top down. So, um, I'll come sit down now. I'll turn to you first, GBK. Is getting a woman, any woman in office, a sufficient win for gender equity? Does it matter to you and elect her whether the women it helps elect to high political office are in fact campaigning for working hard to get border gender equity and social equity? Thank you so much, um, Adney. <laughs> um, yes, it does. Um, and the very first point, and which is um, elector's first mandate, is to get gender equity in the sense that anybody should be able to run for office. And um, if society is made up of different groups, why is it just one group that keeps getting to lead others um, is one. Two is when you have women who understand and have had lived experiences of certain issues, they're at least in a sort of good position to be able to advocate for themselves and other women. And I'll give you the case of Nigeria. Um, recently, about five gender-centric bills were thrown um, out of the house in terms of getting um, signed. They include issues about women's access to be able to, for their spouses to be able to claim citizenship or to be able to own land. Now, it's good to have men allies who can campaign for us on the inside, but imagine actually having women championing these issues from the inside themselves. So for our own work, that's how we're seeing, how we're ensuring that women can be a voice for others and ensure that it's really helping to address gender equity across board, across a range of issues, um, across all spheres of life. Another question is, do we know for sure whether they will get to put all of those changes together? What are the things that we do at, at Electra is to ensure that we, tr we provide capacity building to women before they go into the elections and, and afterwards? Um, because their journeys, we've seen that men are so used to being in this space. They have the experience and women require more. So yes, we know that they have agency, we know that they've, they've had impact, um, but they face so many issues. And this sort of, in terms of human-centered design, this is what we go through to understand the journeys, understand the different barriers they face, and understanding that at different levels they require different kinds of capacity building. So getting them to be able to connect with the constituencies they serve to better represent them, ensuring that their campaign is targeted towards the transformational things that really needs to get the impact beyond just themselves, but others that they're supposed to be serving, and ensuring that even afterwards, when they do get into the office, we continue to work with them to build the data 
but to also hold them accountable and ensure that we get a lot, a lot of wins to ensure that more women can get into the space. So that's how we're looking at it, and we hope that it can really permeate society um, in the way that we're, we're thinking about it as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Sakina. Look at us both taking notes here. <laughs> All right, so picking up on a phrase I know you love so much about take space and making space, tell us about the challenges of making space for those on the margin of particular kinds of power? Thank you for that question. Is this mic working? Okay, thank you. Um, I could spend a lot of time telling you about the challenges of making space. Um, I'll give you two examples. Uh, one from my own, uh, you know, life and on how it's important also to take space. Uh, a few years ago when, when I, not a few, uh, like about five, six years ago, when I started, uh, when I moved to this state of Jharkhand and I went for a meeting with a government official, I went with a male colleague who is a professor at, um, you know, in, in a university in the United States. And we were meeting this senior administrative official. And we go in. I'm doing all this work in Jharkhand. I've been spending time there. I have spent two years there at this point in time trying to do this work. And we go into the office, uh, you know, we, we move in, and this senior administrative official only addresses my male colleague, starts speaking, and does not stop for a while. He doesn't even look at me, as if I just was not there in, in that space. Um, and at some point, that was making me uncomfortable, and I was looking at my male colleague, and at some point, even he realized what's happened. So he stopped uh, the official and said, let me introduce you to my colleague, who's actually done all this work. Uh, and that's, at that point is where I, that was my endeavor in taking space. It, but it, I didn't say anything myself then, right? I, I, I kept quiet too. Now when I go to meetings, I speak up, because I know that that space is mine too, and uh, it's the work that I want. And, and another example is that in the same official's office in that state, uh, at a later date, um, you know, his boss was visiting. And his boss was visiting, kind of investigating some of these payment failures that we had written about in the newspaper, and there was like a media uh, there was media pressure to work on some of these issues. And when his boss came in, I was sitting on the sofa. And in India, this, you know, which chair and which location you sit in is, is, is rather important. Uh, so I'm already sitting on the sofa, and then there are two chairs there. And the senior uh, official walks in, and this, this of the initial officer who, who didn't even look at me, he's staring at me to get up from the sofa. And I didn't move. Uh, so, I think it's just that example that it takes a lot of time for us to realize um, that this is our space too. And just in that vein, it's also hard then to, you know, to expect women who have uh, gone through this marginalization, who have years of, you know, uh, socialization on this is how a woman should behave or you can't ask questions to an official. It takes years to be able to stand up and, and take that space. So I think part of, you know, simple things that we can do and be aware of um, in space is that now when I go, uh, sometimes I know that I have to keep quiet and I have to let other people speak. So constantly assessing that helps in making the space. Um, the other challenge is, is you know, apart from, from women sort of being able to speak up themselves is also that even if they do end up speaking up, uh, act, they're not taken as seriously and action isn't taken. So I think consistently working and being patient uh, towards building that change uh, is something that one has to keep working on and, and remember that you have to be patient. But I think I would go amiss if I didn't acknowledge a lot of the work that these people's movements have done um, 
in a place like Rajasthan or Bihar, I have you know, learned and been inspired immensely by uh, the consistent effort over the years. So I think that consistent effort is also required in being able to make that space. Um, it's, it's not an overnight thing, it takes yeah. time. Yeah. I am going to make space for everyone in the <laughs> auditorium. <laughs> So I have lots of follow-up um, to um, engage us in the conversation. Does anybody have a single question that they'd like to ask? <laughs> Bow, I see you up there. <laughs> um, Estefania is going to run. <laughs> Just one. One. <laughs> Thanks so much. Really, really interesting. Can you hear me? Great. Yeah. I wanted to ask both of you, actually, um, maybe if you could share what are the social norms based on gender or gender stereotypes that underlie, uh, well, in the case of Nigeria and what we've seen, you know, uh, you know, these limits to women participating in politics, uh, and in the case of India, uh, you know, all these other limitations related to what you just exposed, and invite us to jointly think whether those social norms based on gender uh, or gender stereotypes aren't also present in our daily lives uh, in different contexts, regardless of how developed we, th you know, we think our own contexts are. Thank you. Like the World Bank where you work, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't suggest that. <laughs> Actually, I would, but <laughs> all right. Okay, do you want to go first? Great. Um, Thank you so much for that question. And it's one of the things I actually was going to say as I listened to Sekina's um, um, responses. Um, social norms are such a big part of um, what we're working towards um, sort of addressing. And that's why I talked about behavioral changes. Um, because, for example, in Nigeria, you have cases, and it varies across the different sort of regions. So being able to understand the cultural differences in the settings you're working with has been something that has really been a part of what we do. So in the northern part of Nigeria, or even like in the south um, or whatever, you have cases of you know, seeing women run and seeing people asking, well, how can a woman lead you know, men? You know, a place should be at home, or even if, if, if she's against, running against a man without looking at the campaign um, agenda or the the agendas that she's pushing to, to sort of work on when she gains the office, it's, it's a gender, gendered type of discussion where they sort of see a natural leadership that goes through like a man versus, um, say, a, a woman in this case. There's that. There's also like um, several other um, things that I probably could even like um, show you through our work to understand the journeys of women and, and how they, they go through from the start before the elections to when they do emerge or they don't, um, winners at the end of the election. So at the very first stage, you know you have to get representation in the party to cinch the tickets. Um, and a lot of these structures are also a reflection of the societies that we live in. We, we live in. You know, um, if there are so many men that have been in the space, before they consider a woman for the same space, um, it's, it's, it takes a, a great lot of views. So one, in that instance, we see societal ideals or norms also reflecting in the structures at the political level. When it gets to campaigning before or even during elections, it's also that, as well as looking at how those norms also permeate through things like gender-based violence um, when it comes to the electoral process. And this actually different sizes of sort of the women. So you see some of them are scared, um, and it's like a low point in the journey. So looking at the different things, you see the bright spots, you see the pain points. A lot of the pain points looks at you know, saying, oh, you're a woman, what do you even know? It's the limited experience, limited resources, also seeing that women have been disadvantaged for so long, and so they usually have less financial capabilities. You have the boys club, where they sort of, they're able to raise funds so quickly. We don't have that kind of club for women. And so <laughs> it is crazy seeing how we can play a role to ensure that, one, they get their voices heard, they get seen, and in the words of Michelle Obama, that I'm going to quote, like, we're not going to wait till the, vo till the world is equal before we start feeling seen. And so as many women that we can get to rise above those sort of norms that really sort of put them back, it's, it, that's our role in terms of how we're changing things. 
finally, oh, finally. Yes. okay, I, I finally, sure sorry. <laughs> <laughs> finally, it's like, how can we make these women role models to ensure that they can then cascade? If more women at the level of Rada, for example, is seen women in leadership that are doing amazing things, she probably sees herself being able to even do more, and that gets a lot of more benefits um, to society. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Comprehensive answer. <laughs> um, I, what I'd like to add to that is that, uh, you know, some differences are very stark. So you can see that 10%, uh, and you can say something about that 10%. Uh, and it's, 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 you know, it's also rather easy to count. Um, that picture that, you know, you could see the picture and see the problem with the photograph. But some differences are subtle, right? Like me not getting up from a chair. Uh, but it's, I think uh, it's things, these are things that have been written about widely in feminist literature, been discussed, and you know, it continues. Uh, but I think that in societies like here, um, what I have learned is that, a couple of things actually, that uh, the subtle matters too, and that you have to find ways to be able to communicate it uh, well. Uh, in order to, to be able to change the subtle as well. I think one of the things that we do learn as Peace Fellows uh, is to be able to see that nuance and to be able to challenge it in a, a non-confrontational way. And by that I mean that, okay, sometimes confrontation is required and you have to stand up for things, but in a way that you also give the other person uh, that space and that opportunity to change. Um, and I think we, we, we've gone through a lot of workshops and trainings, uh, both as Peace Fellows and you know, MIDP Fellows as well, in understanding that subtle, pointing it out when it happens, um, and uh, for both within ourselves and you know, uh, the others on how to bring that change and challenge it uh, when required. Um, but thank you for your question. So I've just been given the signal that we have only a few more minutes. And in the interest of equity, the people who are not here, who are the furthest mile away, is there any question from our online audience that we can ask? This is working. Can, am I here? Yes, OK, great. There's interest in um, how um, corruption and electoral um, manipulation can create bottlenecks to achieving either one of these things that you're looking at. I want to know if you would like to address those. So I'm going to ask you both to keep it to one minute so we can get another question in. All right, Bikini, go first this time. Uh, the simple answer to that is yes. <laughs> it will create barriers. Um, I think uh, the question is geared more towards the work that GBK does. Um, but I think as far as um, you know, research and uh, representation in research is concerned, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how corruption would play into that, corruption de definitely plays into how social policies are implemented and it's studied fairly widely. Um, but I think as far as research and representation is concerned, I think there's a lot more that needs to be understood and studied, um, both in terms of having more women, uh, and women just being an example of a group that is vulnerable and marginalized, uh, being a part of uh, building the narrative. Uh, and I think that will go, the first thoughts that come to mind, right? Like what GBK says is what, what, one of the things that I picked from her work is that you got to have people come in and participate first. And then is when you, you know, then you can see the substantive change. But if there is just no participation, how are you even going to be able to see the substantive change? So. 
I, I guess this question is more geared towards you, GBK. Thank you, no pressure. Um, <laughs> so, how we're looking at it is getting people information, access to information. When you know your rights, you're better able to hold people that um, sort of gatekeep accountable. And so one of the things that we're doing is, having understood the journeys, we sort of map different kinds of solutions to either the demand side or supply or just enabling environment. Our policy and advocacy work cuts across everything and we're sort of working with different partners to see how we complement their work, how we ensure that you know, we also sort of take space <laughs> um, and get wins. So um, Elected Future Lawmakers Program, for example, is actually looking to give women access to trainings that allow them that when they do get into the legislative spaces, they have understanding of how the system works. They also know what needs to be done um, and they can make changes from the inside, whether it's corruption, whether it's sort of electoral reforms that need to take place to reduce the bias and all of those things. And also like at the data level, we're, we've launched this tech platform to ensure that we can get gender disaggregated data to ensure that we can actually follow through all of the policies, how is it impacting women, how is it impacting everybody in society. So yeah, this is some of the things that how we sort of capture our work to sort of address these things at sort of a root cause um, level. Thank you, good job. All right, I have managed to get us one more question from the floor, and I'd like to challenge the women amongst us. <laughs> Please, okay, I see you're ready, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, this is awesome. I am interested in, because in your flow chart that you have had up there, it has um, drained, feeling drained after elections. And I wonder where you two individually, where you find your resilience, your sense of belonging, what is it that gives you the focus and the drive, drive the community, whatever you need to be able to keep doing this year after year after year? Where is your long-term hope? First two. GK, <laughs> then to you, Sakina. One, um, it's super important, and I think this issue has not been reflected um, as much. And even in our work, what we're trying to do is to work with all of the women who have competed in elections to see, can we get you access to psychosocial support to help you lift your spirits um, up as well after the process and keep you grounded in your work as you continue to push forward? But even for us, like seeing places where we, we get wins, has been good seeing all those women and even the youngest, you know, um, female legislator is such a, a sort of a goal forward factor. Like keep keep pushing, you can do it. But also when questions come across, like oh wow, well, I mean that's not an issue. Um, what, what are you doing? Where is this leading to? It sort of drains you as well. And all of those things is all of my education at Duke has really helped me to sort of put that at the center. Like you're doing things. It's gonna take a while. All of these wicked problems, like they like to put it. Um, it takes a while, and it takes you just being steadfast, being patient, but not working alone. I think the, the problem will be when you try to feel, feel that you can, you can change the world by yourself. You're part of a bigger structure. And so building complementarity, working with so many actors, and building an ecosystem, which is where we saw like ecosystem sensitization, we can't do it alone. So it's like you, you, you need to save yourself from yourself by not putting all of yourself um, to, to sort of get drained, but working with others to sort of build resilience and support across board. Thank you. The ecosystem flushes through. Sakina, last word. Last Thank mile. You. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, I think that answer is not very difficult. I mean, I think there is so much support that people show. Um, right before my you know, presentation, I met Brenda Newman, and, and Brenda said, you know, don't worry. I said, I'm nervous. And she said, don't worry. We're a family. Pre you're presenting to family. And that's, that's pretty much it, right? I mean, I think uh, the environment here has been incredibly enabling. Uh, and not to say that we don't go through those, those days and those times. Um, we do, but we've been there for each other and we've, it's the last mile we've almost made it. Uh, <laughs> so that does help. Yeah, I was looking for you, Brenda. <laughs> there you are. Um, so I think the support that comes from these networks of solidarity and goodwill that we build uh, is incredibly important. Uh, it also helps to see uh, and get inspired by other people who are doing this work, right? So for me, learning from what the others are doing here is incredibly inspiring and gives you a lot, of, lot more energy to keep going and, and keep doing it. Um, so it's not just 
yeah, it's, it's, it's the family that we have here, but uh, back at work as well, the support systems that we have that help us keep going. Thank you very much for being our family. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy K. Thank you, Sakina. I, it's, it's now my, um, my pleasure to invite everybody to um, have a break, a coffee break, um, and to, to gather around as a family. You know, my dad always tells me that hope is not a strategy, but the strategy of this Peace Fellowship provides real hope, right? The real kind of hope. So thank you, women, for being our hope. <laughs> It's really wonderful to see so many people here. Um, so our second panel will look at opportunities to move from conflict to cooperation, two case studies from the water and energy sectors. And this will be followed by the next panel, the role of disease prevention in peace building. And again, um, look at our fellows' bios in your program. So have a good day. Oh, yeah. Sure, I can't wait. No, it'll be Hello, my lovely Rotary family. My name is Sajjad, and I'm a Rotary Peace Fellow from Pakistan. Uh, on the Global Peace Index uh, 2022, Pakistan stands at uh, 147th out of 163 countries. So yes, Pakistan needs many, many more Rotarians and Peace Fellows. Uh, thanks to all the learning at UNC, I was uh, there and uh, now I'm leading a program to empower rural poor communities and reduce poverty in Balochistan. Uh, in 2019, I left the beautiful North Carolina, but NC has never left my heart. Those years now seem like a distant dream. Besides the academic growth, equally rewarding experience was North Carolina hosting this diverse network of international friends, the, the happy hours, my hostings over chai, our evening runs, and hours spent in libraries. We miss the time there so much that we now have established global partners in peace. Uh, it's a virtual Rotary Club that meets over Zoom every first and third Saturdays of the month. Uh, you're most welcome to join us sometimes. I love North Carolina and will always remain indebted for the hospitality my family and I experienced uh, from the host families uh, in the beautiful North Carolina. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, thank you for being here and please allow me to greet you in the Moroccan way, Salamu Alaikum, means peace be upon you all. Um, my name is Abdel Dem, as you have my bio, and I'm from Morocco, as you can notice from my outfit. <laughs> I'm a Rotary Peace Fellow, class 20, and I'm uh, pursuing a Master of International Development Policy at Duke University. Since I arrived, I was working hard to better understand the energy dilemma, the challenges, the opportunities. And being a Rotary Peace Fellow, of course, I had to look into conflicts and peace. And today's presentation is mainly about harmonizing peace, uh, energy and peace. At the end, we're gonna look into some lessons that we may learn from the Morocco case. So in this presentation, we'll have a short introduction, then I'll try to give you a brief overview 
of the energy dilemma in Morocco, as well as what Morocco did to overcome the challenges through the energy transition. And at the end, we see a very innovative project that's called Morocco UK Power Project, which is basically Morocco will export energy, electricity that is generated from solar power uh, from Morocco to the UK. It may not seem realistic, but we'll see detail in a bit. So let's dig in. Energy, as we all know, is a, an essential component of our life, individually and uh, organizationally and in all levels, including geopolitically, which I will touch in my presentation. As you can see in this map that was published by the New York Times, it shows how Europe, for example, is dependent on the pipeline uh, on the natural gas that is coming from Russia to Europe through the, through the pipelines. And you can notice that, for example, Germany is depending on 80% of its energy that is coming from Russia. That means, in one small decision, Russia can decide not to supply natural gas to Germany. And of course, there will be a huge crisis. And of course, everyone in the room is familiar with what is going on now in Europe. And it's mainly energy, one main component of that conflict. So energy definitely could be a source of conflict. And many studies were conducted to understand the correlation between energy and conflict. But today, I'm going to talk about energy and cooperation and how it could be and it should be a way to develop partnerships and to have more peace. In the Morocco case study, Morocco, as you know, is a neighbor of the United States, right? <laughs> <laughs> so there is only the Atlantic Ocean between us. <laughs> a direct flight from Washington, D.C. to Casablanca may take like seven hours and a few minutes. Um, and it's close to Spain, Algeria, and Mauritania, as you can see in the map. I'm not going to talk about geography today, just as a brief overview. So this is the north of Morocco. And as you can see, Morocco being a neighbor of Algeria, Algeria, according to this year's statistics, is one of the 10th large producers of natural gas in the world. And Morocco, what a coincidence, is dependent on foreign energy source by more than 90%. Being a neighbor to Algeria is a good opportunity. And since 1996, Algeria started supplying natural gas to both Morocco, Spain, and Portugal. Portugal was there in 1997. In this map, you can see the road of the pipelines, right? Which is highlighted in yellow. And due to diplomatic relationship uh, between Algeria and Morocco, unfortunately, Algeria decided last year to cut the diplomatic relationship which means they decided not to renew the contract. But fortunately, we have a good neighbor, <laughs> Spain. And then Spain and Morocco agreed to use the same pipeline to reversely pump the natural gas to Morocco. So in this dilemma, we might go deeper in the discussion. But the main important point is Morocco needs to build its energy independency which is a key component of having peace in the region. And Morocco decided not to, to engage in conflict with Algeria, but tried to explore other options, as you can see. Within this context, Morocco has a very ambitious energy transition strategy that is trying to reach 52% of having renewable energy sources in our electricity mix by 2030 and 100% by 2050. So Morocco indeed has one of the largest solar concentrated power uh, plants in the world, which you can see in those articles published by the United Nations, World Bank, and other news articles. 
In this context, this is a very innovative project, as I already mentioned. Morocco is also partnered with the United Kingdom in this project that is implemented by the private sector, 100%, and it, wish, and it is working to generate electricity in Morocco, as we have one of the highest uh, irradiation area in the world. This project, as you can see, the red line is the projected route. It will be generated in Gulmim Wednoun region in Morocco, and it will be exported to Devon in the UK. You might wonder how far is that? It's around 2,300 miles, and approximately from this auditorium to Montana State, so you can imagine. Uh, this project will be a win-win project for both Morocco and the UK, and Morocco will export electricity exclusively through this project. We have other projects, of course, and the previous one that I already mentioned is already connected to the grid and feeding two million users in Morocco. This one will be exclusively to feed seven million home in the UK. Morocco as well, you may wonder what they will benefit. They will benefit jobs, 10,000 jobs, 2,000 of which will be permanent, and technology transfer, which is extremely important. Building the capacity of Morocco in the future, when the country will reach 100% of its energy coming from renewable source, would be thinking of exporting energy, right? Because it's renewable source. And using that, this is the time to build that capacity, that technological capacity. And this project would use a technology called AD, HVDC cables, as you can see in those pictures. Those pictures are so powerful and will be able to transfer that electricity from Morocco to the UK. This is not a project on the paper. It is actually under implementation. They already got the authorization to get connected to the grid in Devon, UK, as well as the all necessary paperwork from Morocco, Ministry of Energy Transition and Sustainable Development. And too many private uh, sector, big energy companies are investing in it from different parts of the world, including Germany. The main lesson learned from this case study, first thing, this is just an observation. Morocco could engage in conflict with Algeria, right? But it chose to, to have more options, more peaceful options. And this is not random. Morocco, since the King Mohammed VI uh, accedes the throne in 1999, he was always seeking peaceful relationship, peaceful uh, cooperation, and even his PhD thesis was about building cooperation between the European Union and the Maghreb states. Maghreb states are Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, and Mauritania. So, and this is because Morocco was founded in 789 AD, and it was the first country to recognize the independence of the United States, by the way. So, since that time, Morocco is always thinking of future generation. And prioritizing future generation will always, will always make us choose peace, not conflict. Second lesson that I learned from this case study, that peace and the mindset of having and prioritizing peace and cooperation could save us, right? In the time that Morocco was about to fall in a crisis, Morocco's good relationship with Spain was enough to get away from this crisis. And it wouldn't be possible without, without a cooperation and peaceful relationship with Spain. The third lesson is while facing our challenges and trying to solve our problems, we should think of others. And this, this is what Morocco did while solving our energy issue. The UK as well is facing an energy issue. And this project will contribute to 8% of the, of the electricity used in the UK. So this is it, and thank you for your attention.
morning. Uh, as I take from my brother Abidem, I will also continue talking about uh, energy in relation to water and uh, peace building. So my name is Yarid Asfaw. I am from Ethiopia. I'm also an international development policy program uh, graduate student at Duke. So in the following couple of minutes, I'm going to take you back to uh, Africa, uh, to the mother continent Africa, to three, three countries, uh, uh, Ethiopia, Egypt, and Sudan, and talk about uh, one mega project by Ethiopia uh, called the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, and see whether this dam is uh, really, uh, whether this dam is a source of conflict or cooperation in the, in, in the region. So uh, in the region, we will, uh, I will going to uh, talk about the three countries, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt, uh, about the challenges and opportunities they are facing in relation to the shared water resource, the Nile River. Shared water resources are increasingly becoming a challenge uh, nowadays, uh, in this, uh, nowadays in the world. So this is also the case in the three countries, Ethiopia, Egypt, and Sudan. This Nile River is a transboundary river that crosses uh, 11 countries, including Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan. So uh, this river has uh, two major tributaries that originates uh, uh, from Lake Victoria, Quiet Nile. The other one is the Blue Nile uh, that originates from Ethiopia, uh, Lake Tana. And these two rivers meet to form the Nile River uh, by meeting at Khartoum, Sudan. So in reference to, uh, the, in reference to the uh, flow of the Blue Nile, Ethiopia is an upstream country, and Sudan and Egypt are uh, downstream countries. So these two tributaries are the major tributaries that make up the Nile. Uh, when we see uh, the contribution of these two tributaries, uh, the Blue Nile contributes 59% of uh, the flow to the main Nile. Uh, of course, 85% of uh, the water that makes up the Nile comes from Ethiopia uh, through, the other two through other two rivers. But the Blue Nile is the one which contributes the majority percentage of uh, contribution to the main Nile. The remaining 50% comes from uh, 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 White Nile, originated from Lake Victoria. So this river became uh, a source of conflict for the three countries when Ethiopia announced the construction of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam in 2011. So this dam is uh, uh, still under construction. Uh, as of now, it has reached 90% completion. And when it is completed, it has uh, a total of water holding capacity of 74 billion cubic meter. And as of now, uh, it has captured 17 billion, billion cubic meter uh, through three rounds of water filling. So this river became a source of conflict for these countries because the countries have a competing interests on this, uh, this Nile River. Uh, Egypt and Sudan, the two downstream countries, use the Nile uh, River water uh, for uh, meeting their water demand for consumption, irrigation, and uh, electric generation. Whereas Ethiopia wants to uh, use the Nile River, the Blue Nile River, which is one of the major tributaries of the Nile River, for generating electricity. And for that, uh, it announced the construction of the dam in 2011. Following this announcement, the downstream countries, Egypt and uh, Sudan, uh, raised their concerns on uh, the, the threats of this dam to their water security. And these three countries uh, entered into bilateral and multilateral negotiations at different levels. Uh, however, these negotiations have continued for a decade, uh, and uh, still it is ongoing without reaching any mutual beneficial agreement. So my, my, uh, as a Rotary Peace Fellow and as an international uh, development policy student, I, I would like to uh, answer uh, uh, whether this dam is really a source of conflict or is it an, an opportunity for these countries to cooperate. So in order to address this question, uh, I looked at three uh, things. One the underlying cause of the disagreement among these three countries. And the other, uh, the, the, post, the possible policy options that can be considered to bring these three countries to cooperate so that they can utilize the resource uh, in equitably and uh, reasonable uh, manner. 
And lastly, what can we do uh, about this? So uh, when we uh, come to the cause of the disagreement, uh, the, the first uh, underlying cause of the disagreement among these three countries is the increasing water demand in the region, particularly in the downstream countries, Egypt and Sudan. Where the, and this is attributed by population growth, climate change, and poverty. When we see the population growth, the population growth of the three countries combined showed that an increasing trend over time. And this population growth means that uh, it has increased the uh, demand for water in the region by increasing the demand for uh, food, energy, and uh, drinking water. The other contributing factor is poverty. Uh, uh, in 2015, the World Bank uh, report showed that half of the world's poor, poor people live in only five countries around the world. And among these five countries, Ethiopia is uh, one of the, uh, the five countries ranked number four. So this uh, poverty, uh, one of the, uh, the, the main reasons for the high poverty in the country is the limited access to electricity. So when we see the access to electricity of these three countries, Ethiopia has the lowest access to electricity among uh, these three countries. Uh, more than 55% of the population in Ethiopia do not have access to electricity. Uh, you, can, you may think of when you think access, uh, lack of access to electricity, uh, limited uh, development, uh, limited access to uh, public services, including drinking water, uh, job opportunities, and so on. But uh, when there is, because of this lack of access to electricity, our mothers, sisters, and children are also suffering from traveling long distance for fuel collection, uh, uh, studying uh, using kerosene lamps, uh, as well as health problems because of uh, using traditional cooking practices, and also gender-based violence is also a problem. Overall, the lack of access to electricity limits uh, development as, and thus improved standard of living in the country. So for this reason, access to electricity in the country is a priority uh, national development uh, uh, agenda for the country, uh, Ethiopia. The other underlying cause of the disagreement is the downstream country's interest to control over the uh, Nile resource. Uh, uh, and the two downstream countries, uh, Egypt and Sudan, refer the colonial era agreements which is signed between the two countries in 1929 and in 1959 uh, uh, to be legally binding for other Nile Basin countries. Uh, the, the remaining uh, 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 nine countries, including Ethiopia. So when we see the, this agreement, it divided the total Nile water, which is estimated to be 84 billion cubic meter uh, annual flow between the two countries, uh, Egypt and Sudan, uh, living, living uh, li uh, without uh, sharing any uh, for uh, the other uh, Nile Basin countries, including Ethiopia. Whereas assigning uh, or considering the evaporation laws uh, at uh, Aswan High Dam in Egypt. So these causes uh, have resulted in preventing these three countries uh, from reaching a mutual beneficial agreement on three major uh, things. One is water filling duration of the dam. The second one is mode of operation of the dam, particularly in the event of uh, prolonged drought. And the third one is uh, legally binding nature of uh, the agreement, particularly in reference to future water use and development in the upstream country. So what measure can, we, uh, can be considered to address these underlying causes uh, of the disagreement? So uh, uh, sustainable development and uh, lasting peace can only be ensured, uh, especially in the context of shared water resources through regional cooperation. On the basis of this, the possible policy options are one, downstream countries, Egypt and Sudan, need to show their commitment and political will uh, to sign the cooperative framework agreement. Cooperative Framework Agreement is the agreement developed by the Nile Basin countries, including Egypt and Sudan, uh, but at the end, they refrain to sign from this agreement. So this agreement helps us to work together uh, in, uh, based on the principles of equitable and reasonable utilization of the uh, water resource. The second one is the three countries need to establish a robust data and information exchange mechanism so that they can uh, exchange data and information on the operation of the dam and other uh, data that help to ensure the safety of those infrastructures in the three countries. 
And these three countries need to work together to combat uh, their common threat, climate change, so that they can ensure sustainable access to these water resources. And for this, they have to uh, develop a comprehensive uh, drought contingency plan that can be uh, triggered during the events of extreme, drought, extreme uh, weather events such as drought. And they need also to jointly plan and implement uh, regional water resource development uh, programs. And finally, they need to uh, actively engage or increase their engagement in uh, uh, regional economic integration. So as an international community, as a Rotary Peace Fellow and as a Rotarian, what can we do to support this process? One, continue to support the negotiation process and regional development cooperation initiatives based on the principles of equitable and reasonable utilization of these water resources. The second one is increase the public awareness uh, on the benefits of cooperation. And finally, uh, support regional level or basin-wide water resource development programs and projects. And I see my role as uh, uh, making uh, the three countries' population, uh, uh, increasing the awareness of the three countries' population to, uh, on the benefits of cooperation so that their governments will have the support back at home to make a, a, a justifiable compromise on the negotiation table. So that, uh, by, by, that means, uh, at the end, uh, promoting cooperation among themselves. So finally, uh, I found this dam uh, is a kind of uh, an opportunity for cooperation among these three countries. Even though it is assumed that uh, this dam uh, beca is uh, becoming a source of conflict, uh, we must engineer cooperation between upstream and downstream countries so that uh, we can ensure uh, reasonable and uh, equitable utilization of the water resource as well as ensure lasting peace in the, re in the region for the, the present and future generations. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. Now everybody can hear me. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, so I'm Eddie Molesky. I'm the director of the Duke Center for International Development. Um, I'm. I have to say I'm really honored to be here. Um, just it's great to see um, this level of interest in these wonderful scholars. But I also just want to say that I'm delighted to be here because my father was a Rotarian all his adult life, and so I grew up with the values of community, of service, and especially the understanding of the interaction between local and global, and those have in many ways inspired my choices in my life. So I just thank you for everything that you do, all of the Rotarians that are here. <laughs> Um, so I, um, you, I don't want to take much time away from these wonderful speakers, but I did want to do a few things to sort of tie their presentations together and to give you a sense of why I'm excited about what, are, what they're doing with, and what they're thinking is, is cutting edge from my view as the director of a center for international development. I think, so when you sort of look at the history of international development over time, infrastructure projects have long been a big part of international development. So historically, however, you know, we were doing multi-million, multi-billion dollar international development projects. And then eventually there came to a recognition that these were less successful, less effective, without undertaking governance and capacity reforms that went along with them. And so you saw 
in World Bank, in USAID programming, a growing interest in governance that helped mediate and make those infrastructure projects more impactful. I think what you're seeing here is what I would say to be like the third generation of infrastructure projects, which is a growing understanding that these big infrastructure projects require are, um, require an understanding of transnationality and internationality and working together between countries. And that is because, as you can see, both of these projects are trying to deal with big transnational problems and to some extent contradictory transnational problems. Growing energy needs as the, grow as the world population grows, as economic development increases, there's a growing demand for energy. Where are those energy resources going to come from? At the same time, we are all aware of the growing threat of climate change and environment. And so this requires an understanding that we need cooperation and harmony because these, these problems are crossing boundaries. They can't be dealt with within, within the context of one country. And so both of these projects are trying to deal. One, I think, uh, Abedheim's a little bit more successfully so far with the idea of bringing countries together to solve a problem. But Yared, that's the, that is his, I think his life's mission is to figure out how to make this work and help countries to work together to solve these large problems. So the second thing I'll, I'll say about this, and it, it comes across in Abedheim's work very clearly, but I suspect it's there as well, and I hope that you get some questions about this, is the role of public-private partnerships in this. In Abedheim's role, private companies are playing a big role here in the contracting and, and that's important because it's not just inspiring infrastructure, it's inspiring private sector development. And he says technology transfer and resources that will spill over and lead to larger impacts on development going forward. So um, that, I think that's really wonderful. And the final thing that I'll say about this is both of these papers illustrate why I am so excited about the DCID, direct, the Duke Center for International Development's partnership with the Rotary International Peace Center because you can see what they're bringing, the skills that these scholars are bringing to this research is an understanding of big infrastructure projects and the type of work that we do, public project appraisal, public-private partnerships, public finance management, governance and development, and combining that with a deep understanding of international relations and international peace. And I, as I said, that is necessary for development going forward. So, I, so I, I hope that this partnership continues for a long, long time because it's been so successful. Um, okay, with that, so now it comes for the interrogation, right? Okay, so yeah, so are you, are you dutifully prepared? Yeah, okay, and I know that there's questions um, in the audience and online. Um, um, Abdan, let, let's get started. I wanted you, you, you know, you had technology transfer up there as a bullet point, and, it, and I recognize that's very important to you because you want to make sure that this is not some neocolonialism um, that's going forward, that this isn't just Morocco helping out the UK, but that Morocco is benefiting from it too. And I wanted to give you a chance to expand on the types of technology transfer that are going to take place and why you're so excited about those in your own research. Yeah, thank you. That, that's really a great and an important question. Um, too many claims were, were made that there is maybe a new colonialism, but the main difference that if I could tell that colonialism, there is no freedom of choice, right? The country will not choose to be colonized by another country, while in partnership, both parts, they decided to engage in cooperation and partnership. In this case, like Morocco, as I mentioned, has one of the largest solar power plants in, in where is it, region Morocco. And that it is possible because of another partnership with Germany, with both public sector and private sector. Like they couldn't build this solar power uh, plant in Morocco without that technology transfer. They have four of type of the solar power plants one of them is thermal, others, three others, they are, they are using dry mechanism of cooling because the first one was using more water resources. And without, again, the technology transfer, they will use more water. And Morocco last year uh, stated and declared officially uh, a state of water emergency. So you could imagine trying to solve energy issue and then causing more harm on another source, which is water, as we see with, with Yared, it may create other conflicts, right? But thanks to that partnership, and which, as you said, it's cross-border partnership. So Morocco was able as well to benefit from that technology transfer 
and the three other big solar plants are using a dry cooling system, so they are not causing any, any harm on the, the water side. As well as, as I said, when, the, when Morocco will reach 100% of its energy independence, of course Morocco will consider exporting energy. Then this key builder, HVDC, and it is not new, it's also used with other projects in other parts of the world, including Southeast Asia. So I may elaborate more on that, but there is a paper, as you can see here, talk about those challenges and a similar case that Australia, and this time is the inverse, the global north will <laughs> export to the south. Uh, Australia will, will export electricity to Singapore using the same technology. Yeah. That's great. Okay, so Yara, I have a question for you. So um, as you sort of explain your work and as I look at the abstract, you have a model in your mind of what this cooperation could look like, where, where we're headed. And so I was sort of interested in what sort of, in, to, to get that model in your head, what sort of work did you do on previous transboundary water relations to get an understanding of the possibilities that are available. What, what, other, pro what other programs did you look at? Okay. <clears throat> thank you, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, uh, as you were mentioning in your uh, uh, beginning, these issues, I mean, transboundary water resources becoming uh, an increasingly a problem uh, following the climate change uh, issue as well as population growth. Mm -hmm. So this uh, problem is not, uh, 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 one area problem, but it is almost all over the world where transboundary water resources are available. So I have looked at the experience of other countries uh, and uh, how those countries uh, have managed uh, to reach to uh, reasonably cooperative manner of handling this uh, type of resources. So I have uh, looked at most popular cases like the Mekongan River uh, with China, with the Southeast uh, uh, Asian countries, uh, and also, uh, also the cooperation between Egypt and Sudan after the, the, the signing of the 1959 agreement. That is also has shown best experience of cooperation between two countries. Uh, if we look in depth, the two countries, Egypt and Sudan, after the signing of the 1959 agreement, they uh, decided to work together uh, so that they uh, protect, manage the resource as well as uh, cooperate in terms of operating of the infrastructure they have on those uh, rivers. So uh, they go to the extent that establishing uh, a joint technical committee uh, which has offices in both countries mm -hmm. so that uh, they can uh, exchange information and there is uh, a transparency and uh, uh, with that, uh, they build their trust among themselves. So uh, now they uh, work together to uh, manage and utilize that resource. And when this issue comes up, they now uh, uh, approach as a team uh, to uh, argue with Ethiopia. So, uh, but that the, uh, their relationship shows uh, a good uh, a best example or a lesson for uh, uh, expanding the experience to such kind of trilateral uh, cooperation among themselves. I see. Yeah. Can I just ask like a tiny follow-up on this? So like the Mekong River Commission, mm -hmm. so the downstream countries, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, they, they yeah. actually created an international institution that allows them to negotiate these and monitor these things and also to negotiate with China. So is this something you might imagine in, in your setting as well? Yeah, I have also looked at that one. So in, uh, with that best uh, uh, case study, uh, I found out that until recently, there were some challenges with uh, exchanging information between the upstream country, China, among uh, with, uh, these countries. But nowadays, they have recently signed an agreement to uh, transparent, transparently uh, share their hydrological and meteorological data so okay. that they can ensure when and how much water is needed so that to allow uh, the flow of, to regulate the flow of the uh, water. And uh, the downstream countries, the uh, Mekongon uh, Basin Commission, have, all, have also worked with uh, other companies that uh, provide technical support to, uh, uh, how to observe in real time the uh, water level uh, in the upstream country 
so that the exchange of information among these countries is uh, validated and uh, they are, they are uh, uh, cooperating on the basis of trust. Yeah. Fantastic. So you can see both of these presentations are really rich, lots of detail. So let me open this up to the audience. I, of course, have a billion questions, but I'll, I'll jump in only if that. Um, let's see. I, I, we got one over here. Yeah. Yeah, so my question is for Yared, um, and I'm asking it as somebody who's been involved for a long time in uh, Middle East, uh, building peace uh, between Israelis and Palestinians uh, through healthcare, now through we're doing this for Rotary. But my question is, people to people is, is I think, uh, oftentimes when you know, governments are at loggerheads, uh, you know, the building of people to people ties. So I'm wondering, Yared, in your case, um, you, you, you're, I, you said you were gonna try to influence opinion in, um, I guess, in Egypt and Sudan. And I'm just wondering, how do you do that or build, I guess, support for this uh, dam in Ethiopia in the, in the populations there, e if, you know, even in a case here where the governments may actually oppose what you're trying to do? Thanks. OK, yeah. Uh, if I got your question correctly, uh, so the people-to-people -people -people interaction among these uh, countries uh, is I found it relevant because uh, usually uh, the downstream countries uh, up and upstream country both uh, Egypt and Ethiopian side uh, the governments usually politicize uh, this dam so that they are using it as uh, as political instrument so uh, if we uh, really uh, create shared vision among the uh, peoples of these three countries so that uh, uh, citizens will have a say in terms of supporting the negotiation to move forward and reach a mutual beneficial agreement that benefits all the countries. So uh, that is the idea, to uh, push uh, the people-to-people -people interaction uh, to, be, to create a shared division uh, in the region. Um, I want to make sure this question is for Abdudaim or a shared question. Yeah, yeah, up there on the yeah left hand side. Yeah. Thank you both so much for sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. I'm really curious. You both mentioned cooperation and the and using energy projects as a way to build cooperation and peace between countries. I'm curious for your thoughts on how energy access in particular is used either for cooperation or division within your own countries. Are there issues about equity, about distribution, and about access to energy that your national governments need to think about from a peace perspective within the country on a national level? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Thank you. At, in terms of energy access, uh, it may be surprising, but Morocco has 100% energy access, according to the World Bank. But uh, we should be careful when we say energy access, because the most important thing in addition to that is energy affordability. Like, being connected to the grid is not enough, but being able to uh, pay your bills is the most important one. And so in our case, there is 100% energy access, and the government is working to have more energy affordability, and like especially in rural areas where people, they use prepaid uh, uh, odometer, uh, like which is different than urban areas, which is connected automatically, and people, they pay at the end, and this can give us a clear idea of of economic situation and inequalities between rural and urban. And not only Morocco, but I think all over the world should put more efforts in uh, reducing inequalities. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> thank you. So in terms of uh, at national level uh, energy access, yes, there is a significant difference between urban and rural population. Of the 55% uh, uh, population who don't have access to electricity, 95% of that is in rural areas. Uh, but uh, parallelly, uh, we see also the effort of governments uh, to address this issue. 
Uh, <clears throat> for example, the uh, Ethiopian government uh, recently uh, in 2019 uh, launched the national Elect electrification program to reach uh, universal access to, to electricity throughout the country, 65% uh, using grid and 35% using off-grid solutions. So uh, in terms of the measures that are taken by the government to address energy uh, uh, issue uh, all over the country, uh, the effort is there. The problem is the capacity is limited in terms of uh, the government capacity to reach uh, in those uh, areas. Otherwise, uh, in terms of uh, uh, energy equity, uh, it's only uh, the capacity that limits uh, the government to uh, 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 go for uh, other inaccessible uh, communities. Uh, otherwise, uh, there is no issue, or I, I will not say 100%, but I'm confident to say that there is no significant uh, uh, factors like uh, corruption or good governance or uh, uh, partiality in terms of uh, providing access to energy. It's all mainly rely on the capacity of the government. So this initiative, the Grand Ethiopian Resident Saddam, is one of the uh, uh, initiative to achieve this uh, national electrification program. Yeah. Um, okay, so I understand that we have some questions from the Zoomers. John, you want to bring us? Yeah. yeah. Uh, given that both of your projects are transboundary, and they involve energy and the control of energy and being able to turn it on or turn it off. Who do you see as potential honest brokers external to your countries who can bring groups together and also enforce agreements or mechanisms to ensure that everyone plays fair? Ooh, that is a great question. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah okay. Go yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Sure, yeah. sure. Well, if, if I understand well, the question is asking who is the main actor to make the peace happen, right? And according to my knowledge, my education at Duke and before and my peace fellowship, I trust that it is a common responsibility and it should be both top down and bottom up from politician, economist, private sector, civil society activists, peace fellows, and Rotarians, and from everyone who could contribute. And it's different from a context to another, of course. Like in, in our context in Morocco, it's mainly politicians and private sectors, and civil society is getting involved gradually. But I think that it's still responsibility of, of everyone to promote this cooperation. Because peace will just make life miserable for everyone in both levels, individual and state level, and also geopolitical level. Uh, who would be the honest broker in your political setting? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I shared uh, Abidem's uh, view, uh, but <clears throat> with, when it comes to transboundary uh, related uh, matters, I think uh, the primary uh, responsibility relies on those countries themselves in terms of the people and the government. However, uh, international uh, expertise as well as experiences uh, also has value. Uh, and also in terms of enforcement of uh, agreements that, that, are, uh, that have reached based on uh, scientific evidences, uh, the international community as well as international uh, government uh, institutions uh, could play a role. Uh, to uh, uh, um, force or push the countries to abide by the agreement. Can I, can I just follow up here? So, like, yeah, so, like, you, you, so you talked about international institutions in general and the international community, and international organizations came up a little bit in your answer as part of a larger list, but like, which ones specifically and which larger international countries in terms of like a third party type of enforcement would you point to in terms of these ones? So like in, in the case of Morocco, to make things concrete, um, it is mainly the political actors. Mm -hmm. And in addition to the popular will, because without popular will, people will oppose any political cooperation. And 
as you can see in, in Morocco and Algeria case, unfortunately, even the Morocco side is still open for cooperation, but the Algeria side, especially the political actors, not the popular actor, because people is there and, and people in Morocco are somehow similar in terms of culture, religion, language, and even geographical uh, paysage of the, both countries. Uh, but the political actor in, in Algeria is insisting of not having any sort of cooperation with, with Morocco. So it's, it's easily stated that the, the political actors, but also even if we have political actor, top management, I mean, and top like presidential actor, uh, even if they have the will, the popular will should exist as well. So both of them, they should, they should be there, in addition to the private sector. Yeah, uh, in the case of the, the, the issues that I'm raising, the Grand Ethiopian Revolution in Sudan, art is, it has been uh, exercised so far. I mean, uh, regional level uh, uh, organizations like the African Union, uh, as well as the uh, international level organizations like the UN, uh, has been almost directly involved in these uh, processes. So uh, these organizations, as well as other development partners who can support these countries in terms of elevating the root cause of this problem uh, should be uh, and uh, also be part of this uh, 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 negotiation processes. Two more, two more. Okay, one more, okay. Um, why don't we go straight up the middle here in the pink and black and gray shirt right there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, like one, two, yeah. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Uh, okay, all right. Okay, this is the last question. Yeah. Uh, you've really been talking very high level and generalities. We can see the big picture, both of you. How do you see yourselves involved in roles to make this happen? Because we can say this and the technology is, is there and, and it, it can all work. How do you see yourselves involved in making those two things happen. Um, so, so Yar, do you want to go first? Yeah, OK. Thank you. Yes. Uh, an interesting question. <clears throat> As I tried to uh, mention in the what can we do about this uh, part, uh, I see myself, at least for now, as uh, promoting uh, increasing the awareness of communities in those countries. So, uh, the benefits of cooperation. So how can we do that? Uh, while I, am, I was working for this uh, paper, I have been uh, interviewing with uh, so scholars and uh, experts working on this issue from the three countries, in Sudan, Egypt, and Ethiopia. So apart from the uh, interview or information that I, I have been collecting from them, I have been also uh, trying to make uh, networking with them. And they have their own different initiatives in terms of thinking to, uh, towards this angle. Uh, it means working on the nations of these countries uh, to raise the awareness of the benefits of cooperation. So I am uh, uh, planning or uh, working with them in terms of uh, advocating for that initiative. And, uh, not only that, but just like I did here today, uh, I will continue to uh, promote this, uh, the issue of uh, the benefit of cooperation, especially in the era of this climate change as well as increasing population. Uh, so I will continue uh, lobbying or uh, increasing the awareness of communities, not only in uh, locally, but also internationally at all platforms, platforms like this. That, that's a very wonderful question, and of course, even if we are talking about geopolitics, we are always in, affected and impacted, and we should contribute with one way or another. And uh, for me, it is easy if you go, for example, in any database, scientific database, and type energy and conflict, you will get thousands of papers. But if you look into energy and peace, very few papers that will, will show up. And you could, you could do this search now, 
So what I'm trying to do is to change the, the narrative and the focus. And instead of, I mean, it's easy to, to connect energy to conflict, but people in today's world need solutions how we can solve those issues. I mean, it's an, it is a, a key component of solving to understand the issue, but understanding the issue is one part of it. The other very important part is to solve it, right? <laughs> so I am trying through my work um, to mainly investigate uh, how we can use natural resources, mainly energy, and could be water and other things, to build peace and partnership. So I'm trying to be part of the positive uh, side and to contribute to that positive discussion to that part of the solution. And inshallah one day would be a, a big scholar and I may have a, my school of peace and cooperation and energy. <laughs> that is, I think that is a wonderful notion to end this session on. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hello everyone. I am Dr. Mapuka. I am from the Central African Republic. I am in my second year of Master of Public Health with a concentration in applied epidemiology at the Gilling School of Public Health, UNC Chapel Hill. Today, first of all, I want to thank you so much for being here today. Um, so for this presentation, I'm going to talk about the community solution to improve health outcomes in the Central African Republic. But before I give my presentation, I wanted to ask you this question. The Central African Republic is GRC Congo. How many of you would say it's true? Please raise your hand. That's a very good score. so much. Well, I really hope that you say it is false. Does anyone want to know why I ask this question? Thank you. Since I've been living in the United States for two years now with my fellowship, every time people ask me, where are you from? I say, well, I'm from Central African Republic. And there's always a second question that comes after that. Is that Congo? <laughs> and I said, no, that's not Congo. It's, it's different. So here, I give you a map of Africa. 
the Central African Republic is right here in the middle. Like you can see, the green color, right? And Congo, DRC Congo is just at the bottom. There's another peace fellow from Congo, by the way. Okay. Thank you, Alex. So if you live in the United States, you want to ask yourself, how can I compare Central Africa Republic in terms of size to the United States? There's a good answer for that because taxes are almost the same size as Central Africa Republic, which is at least 600,000 kilometers square. For this presentation, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Central Africa Republic background. Then I will give you the most common diseases we found in the country. And I will talk about the genesis of Ikeoko. Then I will touch both a little bit on the approach of disease prevention that Ikeoko is doing in the field before I talk about challenges and opportunity and how, how all of we, we here can also involve. So the Central African Republic is a French former colony. We got our independence in 1960. The country has at least 4 million population. We have at least 72 languages. It's a very multicultural and diverse country with a very great hospitality. Unfortunately, as you can imagine, in certain countries in Africa, we have many challenges, such as army groups, proliferation. We have gun injury, refugee crisis, and we, of course, the recent COVID-19 pandemic that also affect the country. So my first disease burden that I want to talk about here concerns the most vulnerable population, the under five mortality rate, which affect our children. So if you look at here in the middle, you see that the Central African Republic has a, a high rate of under five mortality rate compared to the Central and Western Africa, as well as the United States, is much more better with the United States, right? 6.3. Second thing, if we talk about Africa country, we need to talk about malaria. So this graph right here shows us how the incidence of malaria during the past five years has been very high in blue compared to Western and Central African Republic. And by the way, there is something very interesting, like I pointed right here. If you see that, you ask yourself, why there was a peak in 2019? Well, I believe that that was caused by the political instability, the conflict that we experienced in the past. The next thing I want to talk about is how women are affected in terms of maternal mortality rate. So this graph shows us that Central Africa Republic has a high mortality rate compared to the Central and Western Africa, as well as the United States. And the last thing I want to talk about, well, we cannot only continue to talk about bad things. There's a good news about HIV. There is a decreasing of HIV incidence during the past five years or six years. Like you can see, and the last data we have from 2019 show the incidence of HIV 1.2 compared to the Central African and Western African region and the United States, which is 0 0.2, much more better, much more constant. Now, I just talked about most common diseases we, we, we have in the field, but there are so many other problems. What more can we do to improve the condition of health in the Central African Republic? I think, personally, we need to adopt a local-driven health solution to improve the health outcome in the Central African Republic. 
So before I talk about the next slide, there was a question here asking, what individually can you do in the field as a peace fellow? So I'm very happy to talk to you today about Ikeoko. If you ask yourself, what does it mean Ikeoko? Well, Ikeoko is an idea of unity, we are together, which is perfectly a good example to bring people together after a series of conflict through help intervention. Ikeoko means in Sango that I just explained, uh, we are together. Where does this idea come from? Well, it's just my personal story. I was born in the city, which is Bosambele. After I graduated, I worked with international organization, Médecins Sans Frontières, ICRC. I work as a rural physician. This is me right here, with my colleagues. Perform different tasks, surgery, treating patients with malaria, HIV infection, so many things. And then I became very aware that the importance of having an integrated approach to ad which is adapted to the local context in Central African Republic. Like I said, it was developed by me. I was raised and lived there. I better understand the situation. I work and practice medicine in the rural area. And all of that contribute to build a trust in the communities that I belong to. They trust me than any international organization. And I think it's the idea of Ikeoko is most effective in terms of resources, public health intervention. But there's also an idea about the sustainability of the program that we have. Um, I give you here some of the resources that we use in the field to try to work on the disease prevention, and especially for malaria, we distribute a lot of mosquito nets to family, household, and we provide also some trainings. We have also a program on gender-biased violence prevention. And so far, we were able to implement center intervention in terms of data that I put here, 12 health sessions for training, also, um, we're able to provide some uh, mosquito net to deliver um, some prevention program in the community in Bosambili. But of course, we, we plan to evaluate what we did in the field with my colleagues in terms of improving knowledge to disease prevention, but also to reduce the incidence of diseases that I talk about. What are some of the challenges that Ikeoko face? Well, as any organization, the big problem is just funding, right? So we operate so far in a very volunteer basis. Uh, we were able to collect some funding locally, but we hope that in the future, that's an opportunity for everyone to participate. And we believe that having a local organization, any public health organization, developed and implemented by someone from the field, from the province in Central Africa Republic is a good idea to reduce disparity, health disparity. Um, I put here one story about my colleagues, a physician working in the field who is providing uh, training to the local community healthcare worker in terms of making sure that the vaccination statute is respected in the community, especially for polio vaccine, giving this training to those communities then I can go to giving those training to these, uh, these community healthcare workers can allow them to go to the communities and deliver uh, the message that we have. So thank you so much for listening. I want to say singular in Sango, which means thank you. Also, uh, merci in, Francais, uh, in French. And if you have any questions, please feel free to, to reach out to me. Thank you so much.
All right. I think I'll start with uh, everyone. Um, my name is Simon Asayo. I come from Ghana. Um, I'm studying at the ESC Gillian School of Global Public Health. I always call myself Public Health Surveyor. I'm majoring in Global Health. And I'm a Rotary Peace Fellow, and today I am very excited to talk to you about the work that I did for my applied field experience in Zambia on pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV prevention, uh, the pursuit of peace within ourselves. So I'd like to start by telling you the bedding of HIV as reported in 2020. 38 million people were affected with HIV in the year 2020. And 1.5 million of these uh, new infections occurred in that year, of which 690,000 deaths occurred. In Sub-Sahara Africa, 67% of all people living with HIV AIDS actually live in the Sub-Sahara uh, Africa region. And in Sub-Sahara Africa also, two in three people living with HIV AIDS are women. They are main causes or sources of transmission of HIV. Unprotected sexual intercourse with an infected person ranks number one, then intravenous drug use, blood transfusion, mother-to-child transmission also. However, a lot of work has been done uh, with respect to mother-to-child transmission, which has resulted in fewer cases of mother-to-child transmission of HIV. What is HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis? PrEP is basically medication that can reduce the risk of HIV transmission among people who are at high risk of acquiring the virus. And PrEP is taken before potential exposure to HIV, such as before sexual activity or injection drug use. For PrEP to be effective, it needs to be taken consistently and also needs to be taken correctly. There have been advances in HIV treatment, care, and prevention, and I would like to acknowledge the contributions of Duke and UNC researchers, which led to the development of the first antiretroviral called AZT, which was approved in 1994. Studies had begun way back in 1987. Uh, by 2004, uh, another study, which is the IPREX study, which was the first clinical trial of oral PrEP, was launched. And by 2016, many other studies had happened, and results had shown that antiretrovirals were very beneficial. Um, the latest advancement was in 2019, when the FDA approved long-acting injectables for high-risk adults. So what is the problem that I was involved in researching in Zambia? Um, we know that PrEP is effective, but two major challenges exist that relate to uh, ensuring PrEP effectiveness in sub-Sahara Africa. The first one is the non-adherence to regimen because the treatment regimen, because um, the current PrEP regimen in sub-Sahara Africa requires that um, people at high risk take the medication on a daily basis. And people do forget, and as a result of that, it creates a problem. There is also the issue of stigma. Um, people who go to the health facility to take these medications, and community members know that they take medications that prevent HIV, are highly stigmatized. Now, to address these barriers, what if there is daily adherence? Daily adherence was not required. or people could choose the PrEP delivery method that suited them the best. With respect to the first one, daily adherence uh, not being required, that means that if it were possible that we had PrEP medication that one pill could be taken every six months or one injection taken and the person would be protected for a whole year, that would solve the problem of adherence. And with respect also to the choices, what if people can walk to the clinic 
to decide that, okay, I want to take an injection, or I want a pill, or I want a suppository, the same way that we have uh, women today who have choices with respect to contraception. Uh, many women can walk to their healthcare provider and choose what contraception, uh, contraceptive method that they want. That is the world that we are aspiring for with regards to um, HIV pre-exposure prophylactic medications. Now, I was involved in the study in Zambia and for two reasons. Um, Zambia um, was highly and badly hit with the HIV pandemic. It's one of the countries that was highly hit with the HIV pandemic in sub-Sahara Africa. But Zambia also has a very good regulatory environment for clinical trials and the protection of human subjects. And so that is one of the reasons why the study was um, situated in Zambia. Um, when I was in Zambia, I was involved with the development of the protocol and the submissions and correspondence with regulators and the um, IRBs. I was also involved in the training of research assistants as well as the development of research um, standard operating procedures. Now, the clinical trial is, was, is actually dubbed evaluation of open level PrEP delivery and PrEP preferences among African women. And the main objectives for the trial in Zambia um, is to evaluate young women's preferences for attributes of long-acting formulations of PrEP using a discrete choice experiment and also to assess the acceptability of a patient facing PrEP decision support tool to provide young women more informed choice about PrEP options. The trial design, um, it is a multi-year, multi-site cohort study uh, with the U.S. being one site, there's also a site in Kenya, and then, uh, of course, in South Africa and um, Zambia as well. And the study en enrolls um, high-risk se sexually active women in Zambia, and the primary outcome for the study in Zambia specifically is to determine the PrEP preferences for the studied population. It's very important to point out that other um, clinical trial sites are evaluating or studying to um, answer specific objectives. So for the Zambia side, the preferences was uh, the main objective that that side was responsible for. Now, if this study is successful, it means that optimizing PrEP delivery to match women's preferences would contribute to inner peace. And I want to say that we often talk about peace and we talk about peace between nations, but inner peace or personal peace is as equal in importance as peace between nations. And I think that if we are able to be successful with this study, uh, it will help to reduce stigma and discrimination associated with daily HIV medication intake and also post-traumatic stress disorder linked to HIV infection, which are drivers of trauma um, that many people face. I would like to end with a call to action that Funding needs to be scaled up for PrEP research and implementation. It's not yet widely available, and there continues to be major um, stock outs. That is like um, the medication usually uh, gets out of stock a lot of the times in sub-Sahara Africa, and it's not yet become a routine part of prevention packages. I would like to acknowledge and to thank the Duke uh, um, UNC Rotary Peace Center the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is partly funding the study, um, the Rotary Foundation and the Gilling School of Global Public Health for all of their contributions and investments in my education and stay here in the United States. Thank you very much. And that is me. at one of the project sites in uh, Kamwale Health Center in Zambia. Thank you so much. Woo! Wonderful, thank you. My name is Suzanne Maman, and I'm the UNC faculty director for the Rotary Peace Program. I also serve as the associate dean for global health in the Gilling School of Global Health where these two wonderful fellows have been based for the last two years. So it's really my pleasure to moderate the discussion part of this panel. 
um, on um, the role of disease prevention in peace building. And we heard from two of our peace fellows who will be graduating this spring with a master's in public health and global health and in epidemiology. So we know that conflict can significantly impact health of individuals and communities. Conflict can lead to displacement of large populations, which puts a huge strain on our health infrastructure. Conflict can also lead to the direct destruction of health infrastructure, exacerbating health inequities in these contexts. Conflict can also lead to long-term mental health implications for populations and for communities. So the role of health in the peace building process is critical. And in 1998, the World Health Organization adopted a Health as Bridge for Peace program, which is a policy framework with the premise that healthcare workers and the delivery of essential health programs can contribute to the sustainability of peace building in conflict ridden settings. So today we heard examples from our fellows' work to build health programs and to promote um, prevention in two different settings. So Mexen described his work to, as um, really leveraging his role as a community member in a context to develop a unique health program that really was tailored to the unique needs of the communities in that setting. And from Simon, we heard about his role in an HIV prevention trial that was designed to address the health needs of women who are at high risk for HIV prevention. Um, so we see through their presentations the foundational skills that they've developed in public health, in the implementation, the, the evaluation of health programs coming through their work, not just in disease prevention, but in the long-term process of peace building in these settings. So I want to thank them for their work, and I'm going to start with the first question for both of you. In public health, there's a, long, there's a lot of dialogue around decolonizing public health. And so I think it's relevant for this context of peace building as well. And so I'd like to hear from each of you how you think about decolonizing public health and what you think that means for you going forward in your work. And so Simon, I'll start with you. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, I think maybe we can start by decolonizing the temperature of the auditorium. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So um, let me situate the problem. 90% of global health organizations are situated in high-income countries. Yet 90% of global health problems are situated in sub saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. Come to think about it, the very organizations that are supposed to be working to solve the global health problem are not closer to where the problems are. And do you think that it is possible for us actually to implement meaningful solutions that probably are prescribed in Washington and expect it to be implemented somewhere in Africa, and that will work. I think that decolonization is the way to go, but the speed at which we are decolonizing is a problem. I have seen different models of decolonization in the course of my work in Africa. I have seen models where, yes, local communities are involved in you know, health programs, but at the end of the day, the financial decisions are still taken in the high-income countries, in Washington, in Geneva. Money is power. If we truly want to decolonize global health, it means that we would have to localize it and then have local stakeholders participate in the solutions and co-create the solutions because that is what leads to sustainability. If you don't have local communities take charge of their health needs, and then the solutions are rather prescriptive. What happens is that sustainability is going to be a very big problem. So we can solve it from that angle. The second angle is also devolving the power. Let's not concentrate the power where the global health organizations are in terms of 
human resource hiring. We often see that um, you know, a project is based somewhere in Central African Republic, and then you don't have locals who are hired to manage the project. The hiring is done again here in the high income countries, and then you have these professionals now come in completely removed from the local context. How do you expect that those people would really understand and empathize with local communities in terms of the problems that they are facing? So one way that we can also go about this problem is to ensure that we develop local capacity, like myself and Megzon, if we return to Africa and there are global health organizations here, hire me to be a director, don't bring a director from Washington. If we, are, if we are able to do that, I believe that small, small, small steps, we are actually decolonizing global health. But I would like to end by giving a practical example of how some institutions are doing things very differently. And that is what excited me the most when I was in Zambia doing this work. And I would like to commend UNC. I know Duke is also doing a great job with respect to that. So what UNC is doing is that it has set up global health hubs across the world. I know at least two of them in Africa, one in Zambia, another one in Malawi, and I think somewhere in Kenya, um, there, there's probably one there also. And what that is happening is, what that is doing is that UNC establishes this global health institute and the capacity of the local people are built by or are developed by UNC professors, their collaborations and what have you, their joint partnerships for research, and local professionals are hired to manage the projects right at this global health site. When I went to Zambia, what I witnessed was that the entire team in Zambia were Zambians and Africans. There was not a single person from the United States or from elsewhere in a high income country actually involved in managing the projects. But then they develop partnerships for collaboration because most of the time for some NHI grants or some of the big grants in the United States, you need to have a partner in the United States. And I think that is a classic example of how we can decolonize global health. Thank you. Let's hear your thoughts on decolonizing global health in your context. Oh, thank you so much, Suzanne. I think Simon already said everything I was going to say. Um, <laughs> but thank you, Simon. Well, I think that's a very important aspect in terms of 21st century, where um, the entire Africa, the continent, is growing very fast. Um, is developing very, very fast. Um, I think every time we talk about decolonization, um, there might be some misunderstanding uh, that Africa doesn't need any hair. We just want to do things by our own and we don't. No, that's not the case here. I think it's very important to understand that there's always uh, a chance to build partnership and development programs. And what Simon was trying to explain is I believe from my personal experience, that it's very better to look at the aspect of how we can implement any program in Africa that actually have a real impact in the communities that we want to, to serve. Um, in terms of public health intervention, in terms of reducing uh, diseases burden, like I just talked about in my slide, this is a perfect example how we need to give more resources to local organizations and um, coming with so many programs at the international level that always lead to a failure. So I think it's very important to make a distinction. And we, Africa, still need a lot from the Western countries as well as from Europe and from the United States. But I think it's very important that um, we, we think the way we provide assistance uh, to those communities need to give them more power and so they can make their own decision on what they believe as the better solution to reduce diseases and also to 
uh, improve the condition of health in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So yeah, and also I wanted to also to agree on the point that uh, Tamu mentioned about the human resource, how the human resources uh, in, as, in terms of equality, um, equality and how many staff are actually from Africa in those of international organization working, for example, in Central African Republic or in Ghana or in Tunisia or in Tanzania or in Zambia. Those are the kind of questions that we really need to ask ourselves. How many people from those countries are in those, uh, those organizations? Because those are the people who are, uh, that understand better the situation. I have many colleagues who are working in the field, and I'm pretty sure they have more experience than me. They can even do better than me, you know, but they never have an opportunity to speak out or to have a chance to maybe to come to Gillings or to work for any international organization, contribute to the policy making, changing things in the, in the field. So I believe that having that little change will have a huge impact uh, in the African uh, region. So I agree on that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So let's open it up to hear your questions from the audience. I see one hand raised at the top here. If we can get a microphone up all the way at the top. Hi, uh, me and my colleagues come all the way from Methodist University in Fayetteville, and we have a question for Simon. Um, why are women, why are females more, more vulnerable uh, to HIV, and how does gender inequality play a factor? Yeah, great, great, great question, and I, I can tackle it from two angles, and um, um, your question requires that I um, open up. Um, so there is the anatomical factors um, that predisposes women to HIV more than men because of the light surface area of, you know, um, the private part of a woman, which is rather more lined with epithelial cells, and there is not a strong barrier like it is for men. Um, so that is one of the factors, but also very importantly is the economic factor. Uh, in sub-Sahara Africa, um, inequity and inequality is very widespread, and women are those that, you know, um, mostly affected. And so because of this economic inequality, women get involved in risky, you know, lifestyles, including prostitution in order to care for their families, and in order to care for their children, and in order even to care for themselves. And so these are two uh, main predisposing uh, factors that places women at a higher um, you know, um, risk of contracting HIV. Thank you. Are there any questions from our virtual audience, John? Yeah. Uh, according to UNICEF, the coronavirus in Africa was had much less a significant impact than it did in the rest of, rest of the world. There were 37,000 deaths in Africa compared to 580,000 in the Americas, 230,000 in Europe, and 205,000 in Asia. This is the lowest case fatality ratio for COVID in the world. Why do you think that was the case, and what could we learn from Africa for how you manage COVID? That's a well-informed question there. I'm going to ask Maxon to, to give us his thoughts on that. Well, that's a very, very important question. Thank you so much for asking that. Um, I think the first reason, based on my understanding of what has been going on with COVID-19 pandemic, is about the capacity building on testing, reporting cases, so I think there are many hypotheses out there that we don't know yet, and we need more data to understand why we, we have a very low infection rate in, in sub-Saharan Africa. 
but I will try to touch base on some of those hypotheses, which I, again, I think is still hypothesis. So the first one, I think um, we don't have a capacity for testing, reporting all of the cases. Um, I think there might be more infection rates than what is what was collected in the data. That's the first one. The second one, it might be the possibility Africa has a community way, community driven way of managing problems, which I think is much more different than in the United States. Let me give you one perfect example. If there's a case of COVID that is identified in a family, it's pretty easy in Africa that everyone will know that, oh, there's a case of COVID here, so we need to be careful. But that, that, I think that's not going to be the same thing in the United States, right? Because it's reporting cases on anyone that you don't know. Uh, there is this way of privacy that is very strong in the Western country. So any problem that touched on the public health is considered as a community problem in Africa. And I think that's the good point that I wanted to, to share here how maybe the United States can learn from that in terms of working together, putting people together to understand if there's a COVID-19, it should be not a political issue, it should be a, a, a problem that, uh, that concerns the country. And also, you know, we talk about masks, we talk about wearing, uh, washing hands, social distancing, those kind of little things I think even though we don't measure that in terms of data, but my experience, I think those are the things that the United States uh, should learn from Africa and that. And like I say, those are just hypotheses, and we need more research on that. And I'm continuing to ask myself, why is it like that? I don't know, but maybe we'll find more in the next uh, few years. Thank you so much. Simon, you have anything to add to that? Yes. Um, so, first of all, I was at one point on the front lines, and I actually dispute the statistics, um, and Megzon was right. There was clearly, and there is still clearly, underreporting coming from uh, Africa. Um, testing capacity in Ghana, at the peak of it, we had only two testing sites for a country of 20, 33 million people. How, how is it possible that we were really going to uh, give the accurate you know, representation or scourge of the pandemic in the country? It wasn't possible, okay? Now, I also think that many people perished from COVID-19 than were reported. I also want to talk about the demographics of Africa. Africa has a very young population as compared to high income countries or the developed world. And if you look at the data, um, many elderly people were more vulnerable. So I suspect that the youngness of the African population also contributed to uh, protecting us. And even if there was COVID-19 spreading amongst people, the tendency to develop immunity rapidly in a way that we can achieve even head community without vaccination is, is possible, was, was possible. So I, I believe that these are some of the reasons why we actually recorded uh, low statistics with, respo with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Good. Thank you. So we recognize we're standing in the way of lunch, so we have time for one more very short question. And I see hands raised here. Pilile, yes. Make it short. <laughs> Sweet. Um, hi, uh, my name's Pilile, and I am a class 19 fellow. Um, congratulations to both of you. Thank you. Um, so my, my question was really, I, I really enjoyed your discussion around decolonizing public health. Um, and what I heard from both of you in, in maybe slightly different ways was that one key is to really foster true partnership 
So if even if there are international partners, you know, helping with the technical aspects, with the drug procurement, then there are sort of local actors also involved. And to be short, what I'm trying to get at is, um, can you maybe talk about from your experience if you have observed true partnership? And, and, and I want to explain what I mean. Have you heard or seen in the field where there's conversation happening back and forth? So not just, you know, something landing in a country and then something like PrEP being, being you know, distributed. Are there opportunities for feedback to be shared from the locals, from the end users, upwards to the people that design these drugs? You know, how are we, how are we thinking about other populations like adolescent girls who are actually, you know, getting infected at, you know, the highest rate in sub-Saharan Africa specifically? So just, you know, any examples? wasn't short, <laughs> but we're going to make the responses short. So in 30 seconds or less, let's challenge you. Either one to start. Oh, okay. Simon. All right. Thank you so much, Bilili. I know you have a lot of experience in this area as well. Yes. So what you have described is the ideal situation. That is where we all are aspiring to be at with respect to the decolonization agenda. We are not yet there. There are some global health organizations that the feedback that is giving only ends on the desk of you know, the managers because um, it's not so much valued, right? But then there are also those transformative global health organizations that really, really, really take feedback from the grassroots to inform program redesign, to inform program implementation, and even to inform next steps of the program. So that is ideal. Some organizations are there, others are not there yet. And that is why we are all here required to, if we get the opportunity, to advocate and advocate and advocate for global health organizations to be sensitive to feedback that comes from the grassroots and to actually implement that feedback into health programming. Anything to add in 30 seconds or less? Yes. Um, <laughs> and again, I think Simon just uh, answered what I, I wanted to say. And thank you so much for your very important question. Um, it is very important that uh, all of those organizations working in the public health, uh, education, or any other area, any field, should listen to the communities and to give them the feedback for what they they do in terms of intervention. But unfortunately, sometimes we, we don't observe that. We don't observe that. And there are also many organ some other organizations um, that actually are able to give a feedback in the stake, um, to the local stakeholder, whether it is the government, uh, the youth organization, uh, the communities, or the hospital where they implement the intervention. So I think. There are many things that need to be done, and I cannot say that everything is perfect. Like you said, uh, you know, you know even better than me. Um, yeah, I think we should continue to advocate for that and to make sure that uh, anyone who is trying to implement anything in Africa uh, listen to the community, listen to the uh, people living there, especially the key population that we just, we just discussed today. So thank you so much for your question. It's yeah. a very quick one. So you will notice that um, the refusal to listen to feedback from the grassroots is the reason why many global health projects in Africa and elsewhere have failed big time. And because of those failures, people are now waking up to say, OK, you know what? This has been a very big investment. We didn't get the desired you know, results that we wanted. And they are now upping their game and strengthening monitoring and evaluation. In fact, many global health organizations today um, would set aside close to 10 or more than 10% for monitoring and evaluation. And out of the monitoring and evaluation, learnings happen. And then they now pick the feedback, implement the feedback, and we are seeing progress. And it's the way to go. So if people continue to listen, I tell you that we are co continuously going to fail. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you. 
So I, I'm, I might have lied that we are actually not the only thing between you and lunch. There is one more short video, and then we'll break for lunch. So we're going to queue up the video, and I thank you again for your presentations. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Ang Ong. I am a 2009-2011 Rotary Peace Fellow from Myanmar. As a former Rotary Peace Fellow, I'm very glad to have this chance to talk to you all in marking the 20th anniversary of Rotary Peace Fellow and Duke UNC Rotary Center. I received the Rotary Peace Fellow in 2009 and studied at Duke University in North Carolina for two years from 2009 to 2011. Then I came back to Myanmar in 2011 and worked for UNHCR, UNESCO and delegations of the European Union to Myanmar. I also served as a guest researcher in Sweden and as a visiting fellow in both Singapore and Japan. Currently, I worked for International Committee of the Red Cross ICRC in Myanmar. Without the Rotary Peace Fellowship, it would be hard for me to grab all these world-class job opportunities. It has now been 12 years since I came back to Myanmar. As a Rotary Peace Fellow, whatever I do, I keep in mind the motto of the Rotary International of Service Above South. Over the last five years, I have been sharing my experiences and general knowledge to Myanmar youth in my spare time, explaining to them how to assess international education opportunities, including the Rotary Peace Fellow. I also bring them to leprosy care centers, mental hospitals, and monastic education schools to promote a sense of humanity and also bring them to different religious places of worship, including churches, mosques, Hindu temples, and Buddhist monasteries to promote an interfaith spirit. I firmly believe it is the spirit of Rotary Peace Fellow, which motivates me to support others in the community in such a way. I do hope that sustainable peace can be obtained through quality education, followed by economic and political development. Last but not least, I would like to thank the Rotary International and Duke UNC Rotary Center for their support while I was in the United States, especially Mr. Chu Han Lee from South Korea and other Rotarians who fully invested in me. By doing so, they were not just supporting me personally. I believe they were investing their resources into a much larger goal of achieving greater peace on earth. With this in mind, I am extremely motivated to continue this work. Thank you all again. And from a more recent graduate that some of you may remember, Natalie Emery, from the last time we had a all day in-person conference was when she graduated. So we'll get started with that. Hi everyone, this is Natalie Emery dialing in from South Sudan. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, I'm a Peace Fellow, Rotary Peace Fellow. I graduated from the GQNC Center um, in 2019. Um, and since then I've been involved in humanitarian response in South Sudan. Um, but a bit quickly about me, I was working in South Africa doing um, training for unemployed youth, high school students, teachers, um, helping them access the world of work and helping them create skills. Um, and I loved what I was doing, but I was really dreaming of being involved in a large scale humanitarian response. And I didn't know how to get there. And one day I heard about the Rotary Scholarship and I was lucky enough to find an amazing Rotarian called Faith Bam in South Africa who helped me through the application, helped me get the scholarship. And I can't say how life-changing the entire um, fellowship was for me. Um, I got to be able to learn from amazing professors um, through this rigorous academic program. I had an amazing cohort of other Peace Fellows from all over the world from whom I learned. Um, I had, there were many brown bag sessions where we learned together. We had the center supporting us um, and guiding us in our careers, in our studies. The overall program was absolutely fantastic. Um, it uh, gave us an opportunity to take a step away from the tree that's in front of us and see the big picture, see the forest. Um, it allowed me, and I think I can say the same about our, our, my co-fellows, it allowed us an opportunity to reflect, to learn, to, to think about where we wanted to go in life, how we could have a bigger impact and what we could do. Um, 
from there, it was a stepping stone to what I'm doing right now. I'm currently working in South Sudan with the World Food Program. There is a humanitarian, large scale humanitarian response here. The country's been afflicted by a threefold um, crisis, um, immense flooding of biblical proportions, um, famine, near famine pockets across the country. And of course, we've got some national um, intercommunal communal violence. Um, that has been causing huge, huge um, uh, crisis here. In fact, two thirds of the population is um, in, in desperate need of humanitarian assistance. So I've been here for the past two and a half years helping in this response and I could have not made it here without the Road to Fellowship, without you, without um, people who believe in us as, uh, as peace builders, um, without the centers, without those who guided us and provided input without our professors helping us along the way. So huge thank you. And I wish I could be there at the, at the event and the conference. Um, but I look forward to being there in the next few years, but I hope you have an amazing time. So our final panel theme is marginalized voices, expert insights, building peace that leaves no one behind. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a lovely lunch, and boy, oh boy, do you all look great from down here. I'm super excited to talk to all of you today about a concept that I'm personally and professionally very excited about, the Humanitarian Development Peace Nexus, which I will refer to henceforth as the Nexus because it's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, and although definitions of the Nexus can differ, my research argues that we should be thinking about it as a systems transformation model that can be used to converge key principles, practices, and objectives from the humanitarian, development, and peace building sectors as a way of improving our inclusivity, our efficiency, and our impact. Simply put, we can think about the Nexus as a way to re-emphasize and refocus on our commitment to leave no one behind and reach the furthest behind first. But first, a little bit about me. Hi, I'm Scarlett. I'm a gender-based violence specialist from Australia, and my career has spanned the United Nations system and civil society consulting. I applied to the Rotary Peace Fellowship because I wanted to cultivate an in-depth understanding of the Nexus, and I'm very proud to be the first Rotary Peace Fellow ever from District 9910. But what is the Nexus? As you can see, it wasn't super popular when it first emerged in 2016. It was considered a little bit of an abstract concept. And in many ways, the Nexus is still forging a path towards conceptual maturity. This is because when stakeholders agree to advance the Nexus together in principle, and I admit this is a big if, there remain very practical questions about how to combine these three distinct sectors, not just from an operational perspective, but also without any one of them being subsumed by the others. So I decided to make this abstract concept tangible by building an operational framework for the humanitarian development peace nexus. Piece of cake, right? But why has the nexus emerged at all? Well, we're currently living in a volatile world where everything is happening all at once and regrettably oftentimes in the same context. Fragility is on the rise. We are experiencing greater amount of conflict and more severity of it. We have been affected by a global pandemic. We are experiencing longer and longer protracted crises. And as a through line across all of these issues, we're experiencing profound gender inequality, which is making women and girls significantly more vulnerable than men to die or be injured during a disaster, as much as 14 times, if you can believe it. So, how is it that the international system currently works in this changing world? This is the way it's meant to be. We're supposed to have distinct sectors with their own architecture, their own ways of working, even their own professional principles. 
Now, at the moment, unfortunately, there's porousness because these contexts are changing so much that actors are having to adapt to make sure that they're responsive. So I want you to use your imagination and think about how, in a war zone, if humanitarians are racing in to treat the wounded, what happens if that inadvertently undermines the peace negotiation process? What about if sustainable development programs are used as a tool to legitimize governments that have assumed their power through violent means? And if I can draw your attention to this beautiful, muddy, raw shark blot in the middle, I ask you to imagine then if on top of all of that, what if humanitarians in a protracted crisis setting had been managing hospitals or schools for years on end because technically the crisis is ongoing, but then the state is kind of seeing that as an excuse to not conduct their own sustainable development programming, even though that's their responsibility? What we get is chaos. Just kidding, sort of. In essence, the established ways of working might work for a while, but they will eventually become incompatible with the changing landscape. And if we're too entrenched in our established ways of working, then we're not always making the causal links that will enable us to be proactive rather than reactive. As a result, not only are we less effective, we might even inadvertently undermine our own goals. Suddenly, the actors who are there, who are supposed to be helping, are actually compounding the harm. So what do we do to engage with this increasing complexity in a way that doesn't create more problems? Well, I'm biased, but I say it's the humanitarian development peace nexus. So, allow me to explain briefly my methodology for developing the framework. I have the benefit of being a student of global studies at the University of North Carolina, and I've benefited from the interdisciplinary nature of this amazing program. I was able to draw from policies, documents, strategies from many different disciplines, particularly looking at United Nations reform as a power leader in this, uh, in this space, to understand exactly what the solutions are supposed to be and where the gaps might be. Then I conducted some harmonization, because working across so many different disciplines, there are specific ways of describing terminology that don't always, um, that, that sometimes mirror that of another sector, even if they're using different words. So, by putting them into conversation, I could establish where two different terms might be actually talking about the same thing. And then, I conducted a gap analysis, where I compared key policy recommendations and existing practices against what we're actually doing, and see, okay, where is the juncture where we can bridge this with innovative solutions? Now, I'm a gender-based violence specialist by profession, and I'm extremely enthusiastic about my work. And what quickly became apparent to me when I started to dig deep into what is this nexus is that there is so much that gender-based violence does that already aligns with the nexus, even when we don't explicitly use that language. Patterns of gender-based violence and other forms of endemic violence can reveal the fault lines of a society that are later exacerbated in emergencies. What I also found in the literature was that there wasn't really a lot that explored that intersection between gender-based violence and the nexus. And that was disappointing, but not surprising, because for some reason, gender-based violence, even though, as GBK alluded to earlier, 50% uh, of the population, give or take, gender-based violence is still considered a very niche issue even though it exists in every country in the world. And so by putting these principles and practices in conversation, I found that there was a high level of transferability between what is already happening in the gender-based violence sector and the general principles of the nexus. This means that the nexus doesn't have to build something out of nothing. It just needs to leverage what already works and identify the gaps where innovation can provide us with the answers for how the system should be transformed. In so doing, the nexus can enable the GBV sector to be recognized as an invaluable source of knowledge and also to facilitate innovation in the gender-based violence elimination work. Now, this is a very simplified diagram, but the way I encourage you to think about the nexus is like this. It is an operational framework for systems transformation. Its focus is to improve inclusivity, efficiency, and impact. 
between three sectors that have traditionally existed separately, but must be seen as pillars of the same ecosystem. The way we understand the nexus should be built from the blueprint of gender-based violence elimination work. If we understood these as transferable and scaled up support, we could operationalize the nexus far more quickly by leveraging the insights that already exist. But at the same time, we could bridge gaps that exist in gender-based violence practice and innovate in the ways that we anticipate and prevent the root causes of violence. Because I know this audience is very familiar with the concept, we could also describe this process more simply as contributing to positive peace. I recently returned from Pakistan, where I was supporting the humanitarian flood response. Now, I'm not sure if you've ever been, but for me personally, I was blown away by how fascinating Pakistan is as a country full of amazing people and some of the best food you will ever eat. But it's also a fantastic case study for why the nexus is very useful to our work. The flood submerged nearly a third of the country underwater, and that required a humanitarian response. But at the same time, in the northwest of the country, there was a rising security situation. And then while all of this is happening and there's all kinds of different features that we have to be thinking about, there's a sustainable development agenda that needs to keep going because it's a big country and we can't put things on pause while we're dealing with all of the other issues. So allow me to walk you through a simple hypothetical of how the Nexus could work in this context. Although it's laid out as a circle, I do want to remind you to think about this as things that would be happening in parallel at the same time, completely in complement to one another. So, sustainable development would be able to capitalize upon the expertise of survivors of violence to understand the root causes of violence that exist in different communities. That would allow us to not do a simplistic, technocratic solution, but to build innovative and responsive long-term sustainable development programming. From peace building, we would leverage conflict-sensitive approaches that then get adapted, not just to look at large-scale violence, but also at small-scale violence, which would center gender-based violence and other forms of endemic violence. Then we could develop compound vulnerability instruments that can help us to really understand where and what the issues are and proactively address them through the sustainable development programming. Then humanitarian responders who are informed by the data from this compound vulnerability analysis can prioritize need-based assistance to people who might otherwise be missed. As a result, there is better efficiency because these sectors are communicating and coordinating. We have improved inclusivity because we are focused on reducing the vulnerability of society's most marginalized people who might be left behind by standardized approaches. And we're achieving greater impact because we're engaging with complexity to make sure that we leave nobody behind and that we reach the furthest behind first. A final thought before I let you go for how I envision the future of the Nexus. Because it focuses on resolving not only the harms that we see today, but also those of tomorrow, I encourage you all to think about the Nexus as a framework that can be applied not just to fragile states or protracted crises or conflict settings, but everywhere in the world that there is endemic violence, your countries and mine. After all, we may never know what the future will bring, but this way, we can be ready for anything. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming today. I'm very excited to be here and talk to you. Hi, Mom, also. Um, so, okay. My name is Neta Mishli. I'm a human rights attorney uh, from Israel, and I'm an MA student at the Global Studies Program at UNC. Today, I will be talking to you about an issue that is very close to my heart, migration and migrant women's uh, vulnerability to intimate partner violence. Um, before we start, I do want to note that intimate partner violence does exist and affect 
men as well, and also in same-sex couples, of course. Um, but this was not part of my research, so I won't be addressing uh, this phenomenon today. Uh, okay. So, take a minute to process the harsh statements that you see um, on the screen. Uh, they reflect the harsh reality that some of my former clients, women who migrated to Israel uh, from different places found, uh, and found themselves in unbearable situations. To better understand my background and connection to the subject, I became interested in the intersection of migration and intimate partner violence after I represented several women uh, in, who escaped abusive relationships in application to adjust their migration status. During these proceedings, I've noticed that beyond the status adjustment, um, these women face significant and unique difficulties which make the already hard step of exiting an abusive relationship almost impossible. As part of my MA thesis, I try to understand why that is the case and what can be done about it. To do so, I collected and analyzed existing literature, collected data, from different non-governmental organizations and conducted interviews with nine professionals, attorneys, and social workers who work with migrant women. My presentation will proceed as follows. First, I will talk about trends in international migration. Then, about the general phenomena of intimate partner violence. Third, I will share some of the characteristics that make migrant women especially vulnerable to intimate partner violence. And lastly, we will talk about solutions. Based on the most recent Organization for International Migration report, women's migration has increased between 2019 and 2020 to make 48% out of the international migrant population of 281 million people. Generally speaking, people migrate mainly to improve their living conditions for school and due to familial relationships. A smaller percentage of migrants do so to escape persecution, conflict, and other disasters. Gender-based violence is legally recognized as a form of persecution, but the law often fails women who migrate under these circumstances. and controlling behaviors by an intimate partner is estimated to be the most widespread form of violence against women globally. Almost one in three women who ever had an intimate relationship um, had experienced violence in, in, uh, in an intimate setting. Um, this is a very hard statistic to process, understanding that while for many of us, home, means a sense of stability and care. For others, it is a place that fosters fear and pain. While intimate partner violence exists in every society, every social class, its prevalence does vary significantly globally and nationally across communities. Migrants and migrants communities are very general terms, referring to people with different backgrounds, resources, and cultures. Given this wide variety of cases, it is not surprising that studies conducted in different countries with significant migrant communities show that migration doesn't make migrant women categorically more likely to experience violence, but rather it exacerbates um, their vulnerability and their, entraps them in abusive relationships. So it makes the process of um, getting out or mitigate the violence within the relationship harder. Why is that? Um, this slide presents some of the answers. First, language barriers. Language barriers are almost integral to the experience of migration. They affect migrant women's ability to reach out for assistance, to learn about their rights, and to create significant social networks that are an important source of support. In addition, they allow abusive spouses to situate themselves as the main and only source of information about their migrant partner's migration status and rights. Isolation from families and friends. Migrant women have fewer social resources to rely on. They usually have left 
their friends and families behind. And creating a new support system in a foreign place is something that takes time. Isolating victims to ensure their dependency in the abusive spouse is a common characteristic of intimate partner violence. The experience of migration makes this process of isolating your spouse easier and more hermetic. Economic dependency. Migrant women who face intimate partner violence, especially as mothers, are often economically dependent on their spouse. Even if they are able to reach out for assistance and gain access to a shelter, the challenge of um, getting economic independence, of being incorporated into the labor market, and being able to collect child support contributes to significantly to their return to their abusive spouse, especially if they do not hold a legal permit to work. Migration law in itself is a major factor that affects uh, women, especially when the reason for migration is to marry a citizen. So when women's eligibility for migration status derives from their marriage to a citizen. Um, in that situation, the citizens hold a significant power over their head. Not only they can exploit any of the previous factors that I mentioned to further their control, but they could also threaten the, the woman's ability to stay in the country by refusing to collaborate with the status adjustment process, leaving them to choose between deportation and enduring the abuse. And then finally, uh, men and women who were brought up in patriarchal societies tend to show greater acceptance to the use of violence against women in intimate settings. In such communities, women are less likely to place the blame for the harm that they suffered on their partner, both internally and externally. So many countries develop different programs to assist women in rehabilitation from their exposure to intimate partner violence. However, in the case of migrant women, their unique vulnerabilities often make such program less or completely irrelevant. For example, if a woman does not have a permit to work, she will not be able to make use of existing vocational training programs for victims of intimate partner violence. Um, so there, these programs that target local women do not always cater the needs, the special needs of migrants. So what can we do about it? To overcome migrant women's particular hardship in the context of intimate partner violence, we first have to learn. We have to collect data on the national level about the scope of the phenomena in different communities. Intimate partner violence is generally known to be underreported. Migrants, and especially undocumented migrants, are even less likely to report the abuse they suffered. While conducting my research in Israel, I saw that the country really invests no effort in collecting and analyzing data from different relevant sources, like the police, hospitals, and the Ministry of Interior. The second thing we have to do is to advocate for tailored migration policies. In the US, for example, as part of the Violence Against Women Act, victims of spousal abuse can apply for status independently from their citizen spouse. A similar provision was recently accepted as part of the Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence. But it, we are still far from the day where no one will have to choose between abuse and deportation. The third thing we need to do is to advocate for intervention programs that are adjusted and catered to meet the particular needs of migrant women. A woman that arrives in a shelter but finds herself isolated due to the language barriers she experienced um, is unable to gain the support she needs as one of the social workers I talked to explained to me. She came after experiencing a horrible trauma, and instead of feeling welcome, she feels misunderstood. Another example that came up in my research is that in, women, uh, in women's shelters in Israel, women are eligible for financial aid uh, from the state, um, which, is not, which uh, migrant women are not eligible to. Um, 
some shelters uh, were able to fundraise so they can match or at least partially match um, these financial sources to support migrant women. Um, in the past few years, advocacy work did open the door to increase financial support from the state in particular situations. So uh, for migrants who are considered legally unremovable. This change has enabled more women to complete their time in the shelter and gradually gain independence when they went back to the community. And then the last thing, uh, we need to increase access to information. If women can adjust their status independently from their spouse, they need to be informed about it and about any other service that is available to them because lack of information is a significant uh, problem. Thank you very much. I hope you found this uh, presentation insightful. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Susan just said that I have an hour and a half with you. Now. <laughs> April 1st, don't worry. <laughs> I was wondering that no one thought about April 1st before me. Come on. <laughs> I've heard this. Last but not? Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone here. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone who is in our online audience. My name is Gabriel, and it's a pleasure to be here and to present a little bit what I have studied, but also what I have worked and a bit of my passion. Uh, and to start, I would like to make you here a very important question. And it's a, it's a very hot debate on the academic world, but also it's a very hot um, diplomatic issue. Is this a soccer ball or a football ball? No, 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 don't worry, don't worry. We're, gonna, we're not going to solve this today. Years and years that we have, thank you so much. Years and years that we are discussing this. Of course, I'm not here to talk about soccer or football. Doesn't matter what you believe. But I would like to introduce the, the, the story of this guy. Oh, it's me. Oh, my God. Okay, so uh, this guy is a very well-talented football slash soccer player, and he was called to play to the Brazilian national team. Yeah, he was born in Brazil, he would play for the Brazilian national team. When he, they, the national team called him, they got all the documents, and they saw that his family came from Italy. So the Italian team said, no, 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 we are not that strong as Brazil. I'm sorry, Italian friends. I'm not that strong as Brazil. We need him to play for us because he can get our citizenship because his family, my family, came from there. And then when they look very close to the documents, they realize that that city, it was so close to the border that it was impossible to identify if it was Italy before or after the unification. <laughs> and Gabriel was able also to play to Austrian team. And the Austrian team went and said, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. We want him also to play for us. But when they saw the real document, and I'm not kidding here, guys. When they saw the document, the grand, great, great, great father came from Croatia, and the great grandmother came from Slovenia. <laughs> Why am I talking about this? Because, unfortunately, there are so many people nowadays and so many kids that don't have a team to play for because they are traveling around, because they are traveling around alone, because they are forced to migrate, or because they are trying to find a better place to create and to build their own lives. What, I'm telling to, uh, what I want to talk about here today came from my field experience, my previous experience as a fellow, and my research. And thanks, Angela, for being here. <laughs> uh, I'm talking about my passion, my experience, and my work. Uh, you can recognize this map, and 
these are the migration routes that some of the people take uh, coming from underdevelopment conditions and going directly to, directly to Europe. I used to work in this area in the south, in, the, in Sicily, in the south of Italy, receiving and trying to help in the integration process of these migrants. Just to give you a picture of what was going on there, in the last 10 years, more than 865,000 migrants and refugees arrived in Europe, in, in Italy. Oh, Gabriel, this is too much, this is not too much. In the 20 years before, only 200,000 arrived. So this is four times more in 10 years, okay? Among them, 100,000 are children and adolescents alone. One every eight, more or less. Oh, Gabriel, what, what, what is going on here in the US? Q&A, we can talk this later, okay? Uh, who are they? Well, 91% uh, of them, they are male. Um, they are at the end of childhood, so um, less than, uh, more or less 3% of them are less than 14 years old. And they come from these this, uh, five countries, okay? And the most important question, why they are traveling? Why they are traveling and why they are traveling alone? So they are traveling, of course, wars, persecutions, a lot of things, but uh, the majority of them, they are traveling, escaping from underdevelopment conditions, okay? And why they travel alone? This is an important question. Two main reasons that I, I discovered from my experience, but also in some academic uh, research. First, because they are old enough, they are like big enough to travel by themselves, to take the route by themselves, because most of the time the family said, okay, let's save one, and then when you are there, you can send money back and help us with remittances. So perhaps they are doing more for development than us, and than any other organization. Western Union do a lot. And second, because they got separated during the journey. Where? Or crossing the desert, or in the illegal prisons in Libya, or unfortunately, in the ocean. Let's remember that they have crossed the ocean. And it's not a trip that you got a, a, a bus here and go to Raleigh, and then you go to DC. No, it's a long trip, more than a year sometimes, passing through different and very difficult violence and a lot of things and a lot of situations. My research, well, I did 15 open-ended interviews with prior and uncompanied minors, those who arrived alone, and now they are like young adults, and I was trying to understand mostly overall what were the factors that helped them most in the integration process? Because when you talk about integration of migrants or integration of refugees, we can discuss children, adults, but they are a very specific target. Remember that they are in the end of their childhood. They don't have much time. And then what's going on, what's going to happen? They will change their legal status. They will become adults, and this changes a lot, okay? Uh, four main pillars, and we can discuss this more in, in, in the Q&A, but the four main pillars about an uncompanied minor's integration. First, has to be job-centered all the time. Their, their sense of belonging is connected to the job. Their main reason why they, they escape is because they don't have a job. Their main concern when they arrive is because they want a job. It's because there's a family putting pressure on them. So everything that we think about an accompanied minor's integration has to be job-centered. Second, schooling means language for them, okay? Oh, I, I love Italian language. And, oh, they, they should learn La, La Divina Commedia, La Dante, wonderful. But they don't have time. They don't have time for this kind of thing. We have to think an education path that push them to the adult life. Oh, sorry. Third, uh, social connections. And here, perhaps, is where we, Rotarians, we can act very actively, like the next week, okay? And there are three kinds of social connections that appeared from the interviews. 
The social bonds, it means among themselves, among their own nationality or their own ethnic group. Uh, social bridges among those who are like the, the, the unaccompanied minors with the Italians, or here, the migrants with US citizens. And third, those who had lived the same experience, unaccompanied minors among unaccompanied minors. They create their own community, and we are here Rotarians, and we know the importance of community. And four, the stability in their documentation. This is very important. All the time the politics are changing, and then I have, in Italy, I have it humanitarian assistance, and then I don't have a humanitarian visa, and then humanitarian visa comes back, and the guys got lost. Am I accepted? Am I not, am, am I not accepted here? Uh, these are two quotations that I bring from my interviews, and to bring the voice of these guys to you here afternoon. I send money home once a month. There are four people who depend on these monies. Three of my sisters and my father who is sick. I feel really happy to be able to help them. So when I send money, my small heart becomes very big. And the second kid told me this. My dream for the future is to have some money to live a peaceful life without problems, to have my house, my wife, my family, a simple family life. I don't ask too much. I just want to live a peaceful life. We are here in a peace conference. We are peace fellows. I'm bringing more questions than answers, and I can see a question mark in your heads right now. But how could we think a sustainable peace if we still deny a big number of people the simple right to have rights. And I'm not talking about a big integration. No, it's the right to have basic rights. How could we think a peaceful society if a big number of people and people that are entering in the life, the adult life, they will work, they will be around us, they don't have the, basic, they don't have the, the certainty to have basic human rights. They have to prove all the time. It's not it's important to remember that our rights that we have, not because, because we are human beings, not because we are a horse, a dog, no, because we are human beings. And I don't need to prove my merit to access rights. Some of rights I have because I am and we are human beings. Going to the end of my presentation, what's, unfortunately, what's the difference between these two images. There are operations on the Red Cross. I used to work with them. Bodies being collected. But the first picture I took in my first operation with the Red Cross in August 2017, and that picture was a month ago. My friends, migration is not a crisis. Migration is a trend that has to be not blocked, but managed. The most important city here in the US called New York, and we were talking about this in the, in the lunch, it's called New York. It means that there was an old York somewhere. <laughs> the other side of the coast, you have Los Angeles in Spanish, but here. Migration is not a crisis. Migration is a trend that must be addressed and controlled in a better way. And I hope. Where is the ball? I hope, thank you, I'm not a good player. I hope that in the future, every kid has a team to play, every kid has a ball to play, a jersey to use, but above all, that we remember that we are playing all in the same team called humanity. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. 
I'm Erica Johnson. I'm Director of Graduate Studies in the Curriculum of Global Studies. And we are honored, thrilled to have these three amazing students finishing our program this spring. Um, first, I congratulate all of you on your successes in the program. You have each contributed in such fabulous ways to cohort building, to classroom discussions, to establishing professional networks for the students and faculty in the program. So we are very thrilled to be able to have these Rotary students in our program. We thank the Rotarians and Rotary International for your investment in them. The impact is clear on the students, but it has ripple effects across our campuses. Um, I also congratulate you on these amazing presentations. Well done. Thank you for sharing your research with us and your professional experiences. Um, each of you are touching in various ways on migration experiences, in some ways very local and in some ways very global responses to these crises or trends. Um, the forces that cause the global migration to happen, receiving countries' responses to them, um, and international um, responses as well. Each of these is highlighting um, local, um, regional, national, and international intersections with peace, how we in, you know, accept migrants, what causes them to go into migration are all important questions connected with peace. So thank you for this great work. Um, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative to ask one question to all of you and give you each the chance to respond before opening to the audience. And my question is, you each are committed experts and professionals in these fields. You have worked on these topics prior to your program. You plan to go back to them. These are challenging, painful topics that you deal with. What have you learned during your time as a Rotary Peace Fellow in your master's program that helps you stay motivated to work in these areas? We'll start with Scarlett and move down the line. That seems hard, Rita. Um, so, I mean, it's a fantastic question. Thank you, Erica. And I think that for um, a lot of us as Rotary Peace Fellows, we come into the program at sort of the mid-stage of our career, and we think we have a strong sense of knowing what we're interested in, what excites us, what moves us. Um, but the experience of spending two years in which you get to indulge your diverse interests in an academic setting with all this incredible stimulation, the opportunity to collaborate with one another and to benefit from the global experience that comes with being at both the University of North Carolina and also Duke um, is truly transformative. It enriches your ability to get to the uh, detail of what it is that excites you and moves you and why. And it gives you an enlightened perspective to be able to engage with multidimensionality. I think for me as somebody who's fascinated by complexity and about how these things intersect um, and how we can make sure that a single decision doesn't have sort of cascading ramifications. Uh, what I really gained out of this experience was the ability to not only think in this manner um, in a better way, but to actually be able to build something tangible and operational that can translate an abstract idea into something very real. And I hope to take that forwards in my career after I graduate. Thank you. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> the same. Um, <laughs> I really relate to the to what um, um, I'm sorry I forgot her name, but the last video we saw uh, alum, our alumni said about the option to see the forest rather than the trees. I think this is what the, this program has done for me. Like that, I feel most clearly, and um, is that that I got the opportunity to get out from the steaming kind of like mess and uh, look at it from the outside and um, take the time to really think and process what I'm going through right now so I can channel it to uh, find a better fit for myself moving forward. Um, and so that's, this is something that really I could not have um, allowed myself to do without the program. Also, 
in terms of gaining like practical skills, I think that the, um, the ability to think critically, which I developed um, uh, thanks to the Global Studies Program, and the, just the technical skills, learning you know how to speak about things that are so interesting to me in theoretic ways that I didn't know the word, didn't have the words for before, um, and then. The final thing is that through the program, I had the opportunity to take on language classes that I really wanted to take. Um, I studied throughout the fir my first year, I studied Arabic very intensively, and I really hope to take this, that skill back to work um, when I go back home in two months. So. Very quickly, because otherwise I will be repetitive, but the program for me um, was a way also to show the things that I was seeing in, in the first hand there in the field from a different perspective. So in a lot of classes, we were reading things from the academic perspective that I was seeing there. So this uh, having uh, our knowledge, because in the selection process, we have to prove that we had some kind of experience, but coming here and matching this field experience with the academic world it's something very valuable that was super clear, not only for me, but I, when I talked with my fellows, it was something also very valuable for them. So this is beside what I agree with them, that they said, this, um, the, the possibility to see the same issues, but with different facts, different researches, different perspectives, this is very, very valuable for me. Fabulous, thank you all. <laughs> um, we'll take questions from the audience. Anyone ready? Yes, please. No? Um, hey, everybody. Um, I'm Daniel Zavala from Venezuela. Um, and I'm loving like the uh, researches that you guys are working on because it's uh, similar a little bit to what I've been going through uh, as I've been a Venezuelan in the United States. Um, I, the question is for any of you, um, you guys that have been working together during these uh, couple of years and the research that you guys are making are pretty similar, working uh, to support immigrant and refugees. Are you guys uh, planning in the future to work together in order to support like immigrant uh, or refugees from anywhere in the world? Does anyone want to say it in Spanish? But like, sorry, to translate, like that would be a dream, right? But yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think one of the great things that Rotary does for us is the ability to really develop this network and create friendships that will last um, for life. And it's very, it would be amazing to Come, like to have the opportunity to collaborate with each and every one um, of the people I met here. I, I heard in one class here, uh, one professor said, uh, as important as who is in front of you is who is by your side, because it's very likely that you're gonna meet these people in your future career somehow. So, um, like connections and uh, the possibility to network and today also being with with you it's also important and it's the advantage i suppose as well of all of us being young curious and ready to go anywhere that the adventure takes us it means that um over this amazing unpredictable journey the possibility of us being able to be based in the same place working in the same organizations partnering on similar initiatives it's certainly not an impossible uh, chance, which is very exciting indeed. And to offer our apartments for people to sleep in when they <laughs> yes. come visit our country. <laughs> Do we have an online question? Or there's a hand in the back. Yep, great. Can you explain why gender-based violence is a unique or uh, a good example of how to make your nexus take place in more comp complicated or, uh, um, say, international sorts of 
takes uh, situations. How much time do you have? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, yes, absolutely. I think for me the thing that is particularly exciting about gender-based violence is that we, as practitioners, work in a very principled manner. We're focused on the participatory approaches that Sakina was speaking about at the beginning of the day, really letting survivors sit in the driver's seat and guide the way that they want their healing to look, and then our responsibility is to build the enabling environment around them to do that. Um, additionally, what we're able to do is be governed by these principles, regardless of whether we're working in a humanitarian response, in a conflict setting, in a sustainable development program. And because of that portability across these pillars, you can maintain high quality standards that are really evidenced, um, empirically corroborated, but also really participatory. It also is worth noting that the gender-based violence sector has really emerged from civil rights movements and social justice movements. And so oftentimes feminist activism is sitting at the forefront of how policies and practices are shaped. It's by no means a perfect sector, as no sector is. It's something that is continually being refined and challenged as the world changes. However, as we're thinking about this nexus as an abstract concept that doesn't have any models in sort of a functional understanding that we can point to easily and identify. Gender-based violence offers us a blueprint. It's not everything that we need, but the idea is that we can use that to build something that lasts. Thank you. This one is for um, Gabrielle and Netta. Um, one of the things you both highlighted was the vulnerability of migrants who don't have uh, documentation or their status is unclear in the country that they arrive in. If that was, uh, would that be a game changer in terms of addressing a number of the other problems you've identified that migrants face? And what would you need to do to get that to happen? Um. <laughs> Yes and no. Um, first of all, we all need to recognize when we imagine solutions, we need to recognize that the overall trend is going towards a more restrictive migration policies and not the opposite. So even if I want to see, um, and I do want to see a much more generous um, migration policy in Israel and in everywhere, um, this is not where reality is going. So when I was doing my research, what I was focusing on is finding um, additional, like not giving up on the demand to give status when I think the situation um, calls for that, but to also find complementing um, uh, mechanisms that would be able to improve the situation even if it's still far from ideal. And on the other side of things, we need to also recognize that even after, uh, in situations where people do get permanent status, do get citizenship, it doesn't suddenly make them not migrants. So like you can, you still carry on the, um, the difference, the, the um, language, the all, uh, many other challenges that you come with even if you get status. So even if the solution is status, it's not enough. Absolutely, absolutely is not enough. Um, in my research, I got, I concluded that I realized that when they arrived in, in the specific environment that I was studying, that I'm studying, when they got there, um, they are very well protected, legally speaking. So in 2017, there was a law called Zampa Law, La Legge Zampa in Italy, that equiparated like uh, minors, European minors, and unaccompanied minors arriving. They were well protected. If the integration process works, it's another step. But the question was about legal status. So they cannot be expelled. They cannot be sent back. They have to be received. The problem is when they turn 18, and there is a lot of research on this, this 18th birthday uh, because they change their legal status and they change the umbrella and they change their protection. They change from uh, an environment, an umbrella, a legal framework that 
recognize that they have rights because they are human beings, okay? You have access to health, you have education, home, and then in, tomorrow, they don't. So, and this is the first step. How could we find a job? Oh, in the interviews, I asked them also, oh, what's your, are you working, did you work? And, that? and all, of, all of them, they said, well, there was an inverse causality. So, I thought in my research that having document would help them to find, to have better uh, labor market outcomes. But in their situation, given the situation that they are and the laws that are changing all the time there, having the job helped them to find documents, to have documents, because when they turn 18 or when they have to renew documents that doesn't exist anymore, they can ask, oh, but I will change my uh, childhood permit or my uh, humanitarian visa to work visa. So yes, documentation helped them to find the job. But in that specific situation, having a job is helping them to find the document. Understand? So um, it's not the only important thing, but perhaps it's the first important thing to exist, to recognize. Okay, you are here because of this. And just to, to be very quick, when I, I show you my story, and that's real, okay? Um, and I got the Italian citizenship, and I had a very uh, ethical crisis inside my heart when I was applying for the citizenship because just because I had three or four pieces of paper that someone escaped from Italy 120 years ago, I became a citizen. I'm not telling you I have a visa. I became a citizen. I can't vote. I have to go to the war. <laughs> I became a citizen in Italy. And in my street there in Italy where I used to work, there was a Sri Lanka person that's Italy, that's lives in Italy for 20 years. This guy have the whole family there, raise their kids there, raise his kids there, give job for other three, four, because he has a, a, a market, a small market, groceries, pay taxes there, and every year this guy has to go there and to renew the visa. Because there's a difference, that the, the use sanguis and use solis. It's because of your blood or because the ground, you know? So it's more or less a mother that has two kids, one that was born from her and another one that was adopted. May we say that just the first one is her kid and the second one not? I don't think so. We have a question in the front. Uh, Zambian. If Brazil and Italy, please, I don't know. But I, but I prefer Brazil because Brazil is going to the World Cup and Italy is not going. Sorry, tell us again. <laughs> Am I on? So my question is short. Uh, I like all of you, especially the one that talk extemporaneously without script. Good job. So no one. I was thinking about the cause of all this, a deeper cause as a social scientist, I thought maybe the deeper cause is maybe not materialism. Maybe it's just because I wasn't, I, I'm an immigrant from the Philippines, because I moved, people move just out of desire for something new. Not necessarily, because some of the people that moved were well to do. Just, just the drive for something new that everybody does, right? And then the solution, I was thinking, can we just develop the countries where they are from so that they don't have to move? Thank you. Anybody ready for that I one? Will, <laughs> I was willing that someone would do this question. Well. Um, the academia is full of uh, researchers that development, in the beginning, it's a push factor because they have more money to travel. Those who travel is not, uh, let me be correct with the word, those who travel is not the poor, poor, poor people because they cannot escape. They, they don't have means to get out. So when you start to develop a country, there is a, a, a beginning of 
rising in the development. For sure, this is a good solution in the long term. But until this happens, the people are still coming, and the people are still dying in the ocean. The people are still dying in, 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 in centers in El Paso, like you saw the last week. So there is a long policy that perhaps we can tackle. But there is another thing Simon mentioned in his presentation. The aging in developing countries are much bigger. So to make something sh long, short, our developed societies are getting older. We are living more. Women are getting children, less children later. So. Um, there is a, we have to look also not only the push factor, but the pull factors. Why they are going in this direction? Just to give, it, to be sustainable, we have to have 2.1 children per women in developed societies. In US, it's 1.6. In Europe, it's 1.5. In Sahel area, it's 5.04. Yeah. And the aging, like the life expectancy in US is 82, and in Sahel area is 62. So they have four kids more, and they live 20 years less. UK get out, UK get out of European Union, and after three years, there was lack of truck drivers there. So for, even if you don't care about humanitarian things, no, I don't care, that's not important. But there's an economic discussion on that. Migration, it's necessary to pay our patients. But this is a big discussion, and we can stay the whole afternoon here. I'm so sorry. I don't want to big, big numbers, numbers, but it's important also. Scarlett or Netta, do you want to respond? Maybe just to add on to that, I, I'm not sure necessarily about like the trajectories of development, but obviously supporting development is um, something that can be used as a positive or negative incentive in foreign countries for people to either relocate to go there or to remain there um, with varying results. Uh, as we've seen, even just under the present administration of the United States, there's been a big impetus to try and support Central American development um, as a way of incentivizing people to want to remain in those countries rather than to, to migrate to others. Um, and I recognize that this is quite a contentious issue and that it's early enough in the policy implementation that we can't see how the results are going to look just yet. Um, but I think that when we come back to the critical components that people's migratory capacity is influenced by a multiplicity of factors, because of course it can't be simple, um, or it wouldn't be me saying it, um, <laughs> that you, need to recognize that that can be a, a mixture of incentives. And we all have the privilege of being here under our student visas, which enables us to have access to a very different lived experience than a lot of other people who come to the United States. Likewise, you know, when it comes to moving around, as you mentioned, I've had the privilege of living in a variety of different countries because I have had the whim to up and go. And that didn't mean that my contribution to that country was any more or any less than somebody else. So, even if the reason is simply for somebody to experience a potential better quality of life, um, taking into consideration Gabriel's, um, Gabriel's data that he just shared, we need to consider the fact that migration is something that is very healthy for not only um, sending countries, but also for receiving countries. And that gives us an understanding of development, not in a geographic or geopolitical way, but in a transnational community way. I, um, one more thing I wanted to add is that um, it seems like migration in the, is this very big trend, but we need to keep in mind that the vast majority of people do not migrate. The vast majority of people in the world live in the same country they were born in. I think it's the last that, uh, statistic is only 3.5% of the world populations are, are migrants. So while it is a significant problem, it has a lot of consequences. We talked about some of them. It's still a, 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 a significant minority. Yeah. Um, yes, please. Hello. Um, so 
I thought all of your presentations were fantastic. Um, and the part that I found most interesting was the developmental programs you guys talked about to combat women undergoing uh, gender-based violence and women and children um, during migration. And so my question is, what do you think is the most tenacious challenge you might face while implementing such a program um, and developing it and implementing it? Ooh, I love this question. So many ways to slice it. Um, I suppose it depends on your perspective, right? If you're operating in a country that is not yours, you need to be constantly making sure that you are contextually appropriate and that you are really using and centering that local knowledge. Sometimes in the international sector, we disproportionately attribute value to generic, technical, specialized master's degree knowledge, um, rather than an understanding of the subtle factors that exist in a community or in a society. And so taking that into account as you're designing or implementing a program is really critical to ensure that you are not coming in with, as Simon was describing in his earlier panel, the arrogance of somebody who has this colonial sort of idea of what this community needs and then the initiative falls on its face because you haven't taken into consideration very, very small things. And I think throughout the course of the Global Studies MA, we really benefit from that critical analysis of what has worked and what for all intents and purposes should have, but just didn't and why. Like, let's try and work backwards from this very unexpected outcome. So I would say that that's a really important consideration. Another is making sure that you're really engaging with um, those indices of uh, how people move through the world. A, a program can't meet um, a heterogeneous group in a homogenous way. So if you're speaking about migrants, Gabriel took great care to talk about different ages. Netta took great care to talk about gender and alluded to you know, countries of origin and things. And all of those things shape how you need to be thinking about your intervention, not only to mitigate the potential for harm, but additionally to make sure that what you're doing is effective and useful and wanted by the people that you purport to serve. Thank you. Yeah, I think to, to build on that, I think that one of the most important things is to understand that your actions have results that you don't necessarily expect or intended. So for example, I don't think that host countries or destination countries around the world created um, a spousal-based visa application that will purposely endanger women. No, but the fact is that it builds on certain gender dynamics and gender roles that enabled this reality. So it's about um, understanding the, the unintended uh, results of your action. No contribution. I, <laughs> I just agree. They are the experts on that. Can I add one last thing? Sorry, I got so excited by what you said, I just wanted to build on it very quickly. So in my presentation, I alluded to briefly the idea of engaging with the development of a compound vulnerability in instrument that allows us to look at exactly what Netta is saying. So just because your harmful consequences were unintended, it makes them no less harmful. So anticipating that and mitigating those conditions is one way to do it. But And we have mechanisms, we have contextual analyses, we have humanitarian needs analysis, we have conflict analysis models. But putting them all into conversation with one another and then considering unintended and intended outcomes, I think there's still so much more that we can do from that um, and build upon that monitoring and learning that Simon spoke about earlier. Thank you all for your questions. Please con help me congratulate our fellows. So right now, I would like to invite all of the class 20 graduating fellows to come down to the stage along with Suzanne, Adme, Randy, and Scott.
So do you want me to hold the door for you? Because remember we did that before? <laughs> yeah, you need the door. You're leaving yours. <laughs> okay, so we're, we have the pleasure of now conferring the certificate of completion on the Rotary Peace Fellowship to our graduating class of fellows, and I'm going to read the one for you. I will start with Simon Aceno. Simon. Simon. Congratulations, Yari. We are invite Gabriel to close us out today. A picture. Claps. Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Hey, okay. Whew. It's not my fault. They have chosen me, okay? <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone, again. Thank you all for being here today. There are many, many thanks to be given to those who travel to be with us here, to those who attend the conference remotely, to you Rotarians who believe in us and fund this project 
making it all possible. To our family and friends who have been our support for two years, and we even when deprived for our time with so many classes, articles, papers, assignments, and blah, 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 they were by our side. To our professors, advisors, and all the staff from Duke or UNC who accompanied us during these two intense years of ed dedication to our studies. To the Duke UNC Rotary Peace Center for organizing this conference, but above all, for taking care of us and providing us this unique experience to be a Rotary Peace Fellow. To all of you, thank you so much. When I, when I was asked to deliver these closing remarks, I thought, well, where do I start? And of course, the first idea that came to my mind was, let's go to chat GPT. And I'm not kidding. <laughs> together, together with Jorge from Class 21, we asked the artificial intelligence, please write an eight-minute speech for the conclusion of the Duke UNC Rotary Peace Center <laughs> annual conference that will celebrate the 20th anniversary. And to our surprise, the response from the artificial intelligence was precise and very accurate, given names from the fellows, from Susan, and the rest. Wow. This is incredibly frightening. <laughs> or frighteningly incredible. <laughs> I can't decide yet. And rest assured, my words here were not written by artificial intelligence, OK? However. I mention this situation as an example of the constant and accelerated transformation that the world is experiencing and will continue to experience. Where were you 20 years ago? Where we will be in 20 years? Today, the world faces conflict unlike anything for generations. Never before have peace builders and peaceful resolution of disputes being so necessary. Once, while I was walking through, throughout UNC campus, I came across a path of engraved bricks, some dedicated by alumni and some anonymous. One brick caught my attention with the phrase, service to others is the rent we pay for our space on earth. It immediately reminded me of the application we all completed for the Rotary Peace Fellowship, where we were asked to share a time we embodied the Rotary motto that is service above self. Answering this question, dear friends, was our way into the program. And answering this question again will guide our way out as we enter in the next chapters of our lives. I am more than sure that we, class 20, have become better people through this period of deep learning. And we are now equipped to act in the world in a more active and daring way. Putting ourselves at the service of those who need it most in the search for peaceful solutions. This conference beside being the final milestones of our journey as Peace Fellows, also celebrate 20 years of this project that has impacted the lives of so many people. And what a joy it is to be here and represent not only my classmates of Class 20, but also represent all the other fellows who have been here and now are making the difference in the world. Just to give you some numbers. Since class one, we have had 187 fellows counting class 21 from 67 different countries. This is approximately 8,377 academic credit hours <laughs> taken between Duke and UNC. And you have no idea how much I, I tried to say correctly and count it. It's a lot. 
fellows have had internships in more than 159 organizations over 49 countries around the world. Today, alumni of our center is working in every possible sector, including non-governmental and multilateral organizations, UN agencies, and governments around the world. However, beside all these numbers, data, and all these informations, there were and there are people with just one reason to be here, to build a more peaceful world for all. Dear all, on behalf of Simon, Yared, Sakina, Jibike, Abdeden, Scarlett, Maxon, and Neta, we, as Class 20, would like to thank you one again, once again, for being here. And before we conclude, we would like especially to thank Susan, our managing director, and Tom. Thank you so much. And Tom, our program coordinator. Thank you for your endless support. This wouldn't be possible without you. Uh, we could not forget to give special thanks to Dominique, who supported us for a year in the role that Tom is, is now uh, playing. Unfortunately, she can't be here today, but she is present in our hearts, but also remotely. So say hello to Dominique. Thank you. We would particularly like to thank Randy and Scott. <laughs> Both our host area coordinators. Your assistance was fundamental in making us feel at home, even when we weren't here. Thank you for your service and for making us feel welcome. We also thank our host families, who even without knowing us, accepted the challenge of being by our sides and supporting our presence here. <laughs> Among many things, one of the beauties that the Rotary Peace Fellowship provides is the meeting with incredible people like you. Thank you for being our support during our studies. Well, today we share with you more than just our work as students. We shared with you our hopes, our dreams, and our commitment to the future. We go now into our next chapter to make it happen. In a changing and in a stable world, the best way to predict the future is to create it. To all of you here in person or online, we hope to see you again next year to celebrate Class 21 in, on April 6, 24. Thank you so much. <laughs>